Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, November 23rd, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Christian Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held in uh, broadcast online through Microsoft Teams and through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the November 23rd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to, tonight, to tonight's agenda? Yes, Mr. M I'm sorry, do you have any changes, Dr. Williams? I do not. Okay. Mr. McMillian? Good evening. I move that a transportation update be added to the agenda prior to item K. Second, Mac. <laughs> So it's going to ask that so it was moved by Mr. McMillian and it was seconded by Ms. Mack. And then I will repeat that. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, for emailing that over so that I may properly state it. Mr. McMillian moved Ms. that a transportation update be added, excuse me, to the agenda prior to item K and it was seconded by Ms. Mack. Okay. Any discussion? Yes, Mr. Offerman. Only if we have appropriate staff here. Do we have appropriate staff here to, uh, to actually uh, discuss this? So thank you, Mr. Offerman. Um, we do because a part of this is my update in the efficiency review. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any additional questions? Okay. Ms. Govern, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joes? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So again, it will be, just want to restate that in case there was any questions. Uh, transportation update will be added to the agenda prior to item K. Okay. All right. The revised agenda is approved and um, the agenda now stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointments, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. To seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and information summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. Okay, every year the Board of Education publishes 
the comprehensive annual financial report, and each year student artwork is included in the publication. Later this evening, the CAFR will be presented to the board, and we would like to recognize those students whose artwork is included. Each participating student receives a gift card. The following student's artwork was selected. Gracelyn Ubani, a kindergarten student at Hebville Elementary School. Karina Burkindi Castro, grade four at Cedar, from Cedarmere Elementary School. Sabrina Wolgenski, grade three from Chatsworth School. Giada Menser, grade three, fifth district elementary school. Dante Queen, grade five, Deep Creek Elementary School. And Elijah Leggins, grade one from Grange Elementary School. Congratulations. I'd like to give them a. <laughs> Next on the agenda is a special order of business recognizing Ms. Brianna Ross. At this time, could Ms. Ross please join me and Dr. Williams at the front of the dais? Hello, I guess we're over here, okay. Okay, fellow board members, I move that the board accept the following resolution, 2022-02, in recognition of Ms. Brianna Ross as follows. Whereas Ms. Brianna Ross has served the cause of public education in Baltimore County with honor and distinction since 2015, and whereas Ms. Ross's personal integrity, consummate human relationship skills, and balanced energy in pursuit of educational ex excellence inspire and enrich students, teach and staff of Baltimore County Public Schools, and whereas in honor of Ms. Ross's achievements, leadership, and promise, she was named Baltimore County Teacher of the Year for 2020 to 2021 and the Maryland State Teacher of the Year for 2021 through 2022, and... Whereas Ms. Ross's commitment to education and service to the Deer Park and Scotts Branch communities and the teaching profession has been demonstrated throughout the year in her interactions with students and teachers across Baltimore County. And whereas we recognize Ms. Ross's work ethic, dedication to her students, belief in success for all students, professional approach to teaching, and impeccable character, therefore be it resolved that the Board of Education herewith assembled in regular session on the 23rd day of November in the year 2021, expresses to Ms. Brianna Ross on behalf of the citizens of this county our deepest appreciation and gratitude for her service, and be it further resolved that the board herewith extends its best wishes for her good health, happiness, and continued sex success. May I have a second? <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. The board is unanimous. Congratulations, Ms. Ross. <laughs> Thank you. At this time, Ms. Ross, we invite you to bring remarks. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you so much to, to Dr. Williams, to Ms. Scott, to the entire Board of Education um, for creating this space to recognize my passion and my work in service of our students. Um, also, thank you that nobody opposed that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, this recognition has just been one of the greatest honors of my life because I get to represent, um, in particular, the extraordinary educators in Baltimore County. Um, I know firsthand just how tirelessly our teachers are working to ensure that our 
students are getting the very best that we can offer them. Um, and BCPS teachers are some of the most resilient, committed, and relentless educators in this state and certainly in our country. And I'm just proud to represent this part of Maryland. Um, and more than anything, I'm really proud to represent and honored to represent the Randallstown community. Um, like Ms. Scott mentioned, I've spent the last seven years serving the families of Randallstown and Owings Mills and at Scotts Branch Elementary and at Deer Park Middle Magnet. And so I know how important it is for our black and our brown students to have this kind of representation. When I was growing up, I didn't have very many teachers of color when I was in school, and it was very isolating. And so I became a teacher because I wanted to be the teacher that I needed when I was growing up. I needed someone who understood my perspective, who created a space to affirm my race and my culture, and who created a sense of urgency around my education. So while this award has been an incredible honor for me, it really has been about communicating to my students that they are worthy and deserving of the very best teachers and the very best kind of education. Um, and I think I think I would be remiss, and I have to mention um, that this award has come in a really interesting time because this year has been challenging. And I know you will hear teachers say it today. I know you've heard it already this year that this year has been challenging. I have never been more tired than I am right now. I talked to an educator the other day who said every week is like first week tired, that every day we come home, like that first week of school where you are just tired, and it is a challenge. And what we're seeing in our schools right now is that our students are showing up with trauma. They have come to school with trauma the last two years have brought unmitigated change for them, from the transition to virtual learning, to the loss of family members due to COVID, to economic depression, especially in communities like mine, where students are already disenfranchised, um, and they represent the students who sit in the margins. And so I say all that to say that while I, it, this is challenging and this year has been hard, I am not without hope. Um, and so I really look forward in this next year to working with other educators who are committed to teaching that is rooted in justice, love, and liberation for our students. And what I know and what I'm learning every day is that loving our students means interrogating our own patterns of thinking and our classroom practices to reveal the ways in which we unconsciously hold biases to understand that sometimes the things that we did before don't work. I think what we thought this year was we were going to come back and it would be business as usual. And it is not usual. And this is not a return to normal. We are redefining normal. And so we need to learn as educators, as teachers, as administrators, as board members, what it means to love our students again, how we do that differently. It means learning how to sustain the difficult conversations that uncover our injustices and inequities in our classrooms, in our schools, and in education. It means developing meaningful relationships with our students, creating spaces where they can be their authentic selves. And loving them really means reconditioning our thinking and reframing our narratives about who our children are so that we can maximize their potential for who they can be. So in this next year, I really look forward to doing that. Thank you so much for this space to recognize not just my work, but the work of all the incredible educators in Baltimore County. Thank you for this honor and this opportunity. Thank you, and again, congratulations, Ms. Ross. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Terminations. Any questions? Retirements. Any questions? Resignations. Questions? Deceased recognition of service. Questions? Okay. Thank you. Hearing none. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 through F4? So move, Matt. Do second I have a second? Offerman. Thank you. That was moved by Ms. Mack, seconded by Mr. Offerman. Um, any discussion? Of course. It looks like there is a question from Ms. Causey. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for this report. Um, I did have a question. It does seem that with the hiring that has been happening and also the uh, resignations and retirements slowing down dramatically, um, I was hopeful that 
um, if not this evening, but soon that there could be an update to the board and the public of the uh, number of vacancies um, so that we can see the progress that is being made. Thank you, ma'am. We will provide um, a copy of the vacancy report to the board and we'll provide that prior to the next board meeting. Okay, thank you. And is there something that can be provided to the public also? Because as I mentioned there, it, uh, we, we seem to be in an encouraging trend right now. Thank you, I understand. We'll provide that information to the board and we'll confer internally with respect to the information that we provide external. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Thank you. Okay, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Good evening, everyone, Madam Ch Chair and members of the board. I'm bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. There are two specialists, board certified behavior analysts in the Office of Teaching and Learning and Senior Operations Supervisor, Environmental Services in the Office of Facilities Support Services. Yes. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in exhibits Z1? So moved, Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you, any discussion? Okay, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams? So our first appointment is Bethany B. Fitzgerald as the specialist board certified behavior analyst in the office of teaching and learning currently she is the teacher of special education and inclusion at pine grove elementary school and she brings to us over nine years of experience where she served as a special ed teacher and previous experience in prince george's county public schools as well as baltimore city public schools and rainbow rainbow bridge international school so congratulations, Bethany B. Fitzgerald. We can clap. <laughs> Our next appointment is Brandon S. Richardson as the Senior Operations Supervisor, Environmental Services in the Office of Facility Support Services. Currently, he's the Industrial Hygienist One in the Office of Facility Support Services. He brings to us over eight years of experience where he has served as the Industrial Hygienist One in the Office of Facility Support Services, Industrial Hygienist Two in the Office of Facility Support Services, and the Environmental Technician Asbestos Management in the Office of Facility Support Services. He also has previous experience in Industrial Hygiene Services Incorporation for over three years. Congratulations, Brandon S. Richardson. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on board policies. This is the first reader for these policies. Members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. And that is, or they are rather, policy 8221, duties and responsibilities, board officers, chair, vice chair duties. Number two, policy 8311, operations, meetings. Policy number three, policy 8314, operations, meetings, agenda. 
and to accept the report of the committee's recommendation to approve new board policy 8601, board member conduct, use of social media. These policies are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit H. They are also presented for public comment prior to the final vote. May I have a motion to accept the recommendation of the board's policy review committee for policies 8221, 8311, 8314, and 8601. So moved, Thomas. Thank you. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing none, uh, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Move on. <coughs> Ms. No. Mack? I'm sorry, Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Dr. I'm sorry, Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Sorry. Our next item is uh, public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits the, to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three-minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the board may submit their comments to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education Participation by the Public. It is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. First to speak is... I'm sorry, it doesn't look like we have any elected officials. So we then move to our stakeholders. And the first uh, person on our stakeholder group is Ms. Cindy Sexton from TABCO. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and member of the board. First, let me congratulate Brianna Ross. Brianna's energy, passion, and devotion to her students and her profession are an inspiration to all of us. Thank you, Brianna. 
Elsewhere, our schools continue to struggle with staffing. Unfilled positions, resignations, retirements, the cold and flu season, and more are adding to the workload and stress for our educators. Overwhelmed and exhausted are the words I hear most frequently. And again, I ask, as I have many times before, what can we take off the plates of our educators? Every single task simply cannot be a priority. When speaking with my counterparts in other Central Maryland counties, I hear similar stories. Educators leaving at double or triple the resignations and retirements of prior years. Countless phone calls and emails every day asking how to resign. Concerns about meeting the social emotional needs of students while still trying to maintain the pacing expectations of the curriculum. And still numerous correction questions about when pay will be corrected, salary lane changes, coverage and compensation. I assure them that BCPS is working tirelessly on this, but patience is thin. I know there is a genuine desire to address concerns and work together to do the right thing, and I thank all BCPS leadership and staff for their work as they get through these challenges. A quick word on the calendar, since uh, Mr. Kuhn brought up the MSEA convention day at the last board meeting, I just want to say many educators do attend workshops and professional development that day. These offer opportunities that may not be available elsewhere, and they do help our educators to hone their skills so they can better serve our students. Please do not take this opportunity from them. Additionally, I know everyone has their own personal opinion about when school should start, but I ask you to please look at what is best for our students' academic needs. What option lends itself to truly raising the bar, closing gaps, and preparing for our future? And finally, thank you to all our educators who give selflessly every day for our students, and to everyone in Team BCPS, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next is Mr. Bash Farone from CAEAC. Madam Chair, I asked for uh, playing a tape my members made for the Board of Education. I don't know. If, I'm sorry. Uh, my members made a nice tape for all of you in appreciation. Okay. And I put it on YouTube. I send it to be played in the same way like you do your own tape at the president's corner. Okay. But yes. No, we're not able to do that. This is for public comments. So um, if you sent it to us, we appreciate it, and I'm sure that we will view it. Thank you. Okay. I'll email it. So I'm going to be brief. Good evening, everyone. So the central area, basically, in a brief... Uh, uh, matter made a short one and a half minute tape really appreciating your work. I know we are in Thanksgiving and you have a very difficult job. And you don't have enough money to make everybody happy. So basically all the members appreciate your input. We met three times this month and our team is functional and for the most part is energetic and very eager to accomplish the service that we are supposed to provide for you, the Board of Education. However, I do not think that idle members would help the cause. So basically, I ask you as a board to help us recruit four more members. That would make our central area much more effective. Our next meeting is on December 1st, 7 p.m. in Dumberton Middle School. And it is about transportation. Uh, Dr. Jess uh, uh, Grimm has agreed to speak for, for that issue, which is very timely and very important. And I really invite all the board members to participate. I know you can't really all come at the same time, but I wish that you would. And I really invite the community out there to attend this meeting. Um, if you have difficulty in finding our flyers, call me. My numbers are all over the internet. And I'll be glad to send anyone who is interested in this topic. 
My personal view is that it is better to communicate with the right people, and we have the right person on that subject. So instead of people demonstrating and complaining and so forth, come to the meeting, make the issues, listen to the difficulties that the school system uh, have and uh, to the possible solutions that uh, may be offered. Last but not least, I would like really to ask you to think about modernizing our school system. I mean, the school bus is the same. The issues are the same. The teachers want more money. The buildings need to be repaired. The system cannot stay the same. And unless we really think outside the box and find creative solutions better than what we have, I just don't find any way to make teachers happy and bus drivers happy and the buildings brand new and so forth. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Linda Jones from AFSME. I left my glasses out in the car, so excuse me. Good evening, Superintendent, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. My name is Linda Jones, and I'm a proud employee of the Food Nutrition Services Team for Baltimore County Public Schools and treasurer of Ask Me Local 434. Here with permission, on behalf of Brian Epps, we represent all Ask Me workers who support the critical infrastructure of our school system. I'm here before you today to express my concerns with regard to the current state of working conditions for myself and coworkers within the school system. Dedica dedicated employees like myself to continue to weather the storm of the unprecedented health crisis that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Our work helps to ensure that the system lives up to its vision and goals, which we fully support. The dedicated workers I mentioned push every day to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare our students for a bright future. The work our food and building service workers provide every day to thousands of students, faculty, and staff is critical to the daily operations of BCPS. We make sure the students have a balanced meal to fuel a productive school day, and we keep our schools clean, safe, and sturdy to provide the best learning environment possible. The pandemic has impacted nearly all elements of our lives and has exasperated the ongoing staff issue. Today we are here to bring three goals to action to the board. One, the system absolutely needs to address the ongoing staff, staffing shortages by making sure that all schools have a fully staffed complement that meets the needs of the system. Two, protect our wages by putting in place effective systems so that all receive an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. Three, last but not least, we call for a fair and liberal wage by paying all new hires at least $15 an hour and adjusting pres present employees' wage accordingly to meet the rising costs associated with the cost of living, inflation, and our changing economy. Many of the actions we are calling are continue with the Baltimore County Public Schools Operational Efficiency Review Report released this past September and can also be supported by using, utilizing pandemic relieving funds. As our members have supported the missions of BCPS, we will continue to do our jobs to create a more efficient and effective system. All of our ASME employees have been on the front line since March 13, 2020. When schools and offices were closed, ASME members were the only ones who were required to be in the buildings. We thank Superintendent Dr. Williams for his leadership and commitment to supporting the most important resource of our system, the faculty and staff. It is my hope that BCPS leads the way in showing us our worth by paying all ASME represented employees a living wage. Thank you. Next is general public comment. And our first speaker is Taylor Boren.
Good evening. My name is Taylor Boren, and I am an art teacher at Logan Elementary and a District 3 representative on the TABCO Board of Directors. I am here tonight to speak about the dire need for adequate subs and staffing. This problem is not new. Since the start of the 2018-19 school year, fewer than half of the sub jobs I have posted in SmartFind Express have been accepted. As it currently stands, the last time a sub accepted a job I posted was over a year ago. We recently celebrated Substitute Educator Appreciation Day in BCPS, but BCPS's largest sub pool, our IAs and paraeducators, deserve more than just our gratitude. These staff members tirelessly cover classes day in and day out. They do this without even a guarantee of no furloughs or layoffs for next year. BCPS can and must do right by these staff members. Every time a sub job goes unfilled, an educator, ESP, or administrator loses planning time in order to provide coverage. For the remainder of my time, I would like to share with you a list of good faith efforts that can be taken by the board to begin addressing this crisis. In the short term, number one, increase the pay and lessen the requirements for substitute educators. We are requiring college credits to be a sub, but the pay is less than many retail and food service jobs with no college requirements. There are fewer requirements to run for the Board of Education than there are to become a substitute teacher. Number two, return to the whole day, half day pay system for subs. Subs used to be paid for either a whole day or half day of work. Now the system is hourly. When educators need to be out for an hour or two to attend PD or a medical appointment, Subs are not taking the jobs. The pay is too little for it to be worth their time. And two action items to consider as we look ahead to the 22-23 school year. Number one, provide funding for salaried permanent subs in every school. I cannot recall the last time we did not have an open sub position on any given day in my school. And number two, re-examine elementary school staffing. We are insufficiently staffed for the additional 15 minutes of time that has been added to the day. For this reason, ESPs and resource staff are consistently covering the extra 15 minutes for homeroom teachers in each elementary school. This takes them away from the important work they were hired to do. Finally, I would like to make a personal appeal to each of you to join the BCPS sub, sub pool and commit to subbing in our highest needs schools on a monthly basis. This would help fill the numerous vacancies in our sub pool while also giving you a firsthand look at the school system over which you preside. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next we have Jean Milstein. Good evening. My name is Jenny Milstein and I'm a paraeducator in a comprehensive high school. I want to talk about our lack of effective access to technology, especially computers. This issue predates the pandemic and it predates the ransomware attack. In fact, when BCPS moved to one-to-one -to -one devices, teachers and students got computers, paraeducators and other instructional support staff did not. When teachers started introducing technology into their lessons, we did what educators always do, we adapted. We learned how to use programs by looking over students Shoulders, we found and set up desktop computers in the backs of classrooms and used them beyond the point of obsolescence. When the pandemic hit in March of 2020 and it became clear that we would not be returning to school buildings, we had to beg, borrow, or buy computers so that we could stay connected with the students we had spent years building connections with, some of whom we knew we would never see in person again. Ironically, we were supposed to receive devices the week of the ransomware attack, that attack meant that those computers went out to teachers who urgently needed them to reach and teach their students. This event left us with two equally unpalatable choices. Continue using our personal devices with no guarantee of safety, or decline to log on using those devices and add to the stress of teachers who may have lost everything they had ever done for the county. In February 2021, I became the proud owner of a BCPS-issued Chromebook. Now, don't get me wrong, I am grateful to have a working computer. However, the computer that BCPS deems adequate for me is one that a high school student is supposed to swap out for a Windows machine. 
The Chromebook lacks basic functionality, which prevents me from fulfilling my job responsibilities effectively. During teacher's report week, I was tasked with mailing documents. The versions of Microsoft products I have access to on the Chromebook does not allow for mail merge. More pressingly, even when I completed the address labels, I found I had no direct access to network printers. In fact, it appears that BCPS does not think that we need the ability to print at all. When the with the substitute and staff shortage, many of us are covering classes. Chromebooks do not connect seamlessly with projectors. At our school, we have brand new smart boards, and we are unable to use those while covering classes either. It should be noted that the student devices issued to high school students will do both. Our students rely on us. They rely on us for consistency if the teacher is absent. They rely on us for academic support in the form of the provision of legally mandated accommodations and modifications. They also rely on us for social emotional support. This do more with less philosophy is hurting our abilities to do our jobs effectively. It is hurting staff and it is hurting students. Support personnel are essential to student success and should be treated as such, not as an afterthought. Thank you. Next is Ms. Megan Hughes. Good evening. My name is Megan Hughes, mother to three BCPS students. Over and over the last year we heard the kids are resilient. I think we all hope that to be true, but many of us knew in our hearts that this generation of kids would forever be affected by the long school closures. Although many don't want to admit that there is such a thing as learning loss, many students never turned on their camera and were disengaged last year, and I'm sure this was frustrating for the teachers. Were some students successful? Of course. Were the majority of students successful? I think the proof is in the numbers and the huge increase in failing grades. One friend of mine who's a teacher said that if they actually held back the students that should have been held back, the entire system would have imploded. Teachers are dealing with unprecedented levels of behavior issues in classes, ranging from outright violence to total disengagement. My friend said that it has never been this bad before. So what are the solutions? For one, there needs to be consistent consequences for violent behavior, and it's so important to get the parents involved. Many teachers say that kids are violent, are consistently sent back to the classroom, and that is hurtful and stressful for the teacher, along with all the other students in the class that are trying to learn. Number two is masks. No matter how many people say wearing a mask is not a big deal, there is evidence to show it does affect engagement, social cues, and learning. I realize that currently the decision is at the state level and out of your hands. Eventually the decision will be placed back at the local level where it belongs. You guys need to be discussing now what your plans are for off-ramping masks. My question for you is do you see kids wearing masks next year, two years from now, five years from now, forever? The truth is that COVID is here to stay. We will not be able to eradicate it, but we need to learn to live with it. People have the option to get vaccines. However, I think ultimately it will be early treatment and lifestyle changes that will help get us out of this mess. I hope that in health and PE classes, the kids are taught how important exercise, nutrition, and sleep are for the health of the individual, whether it's prevention of chronic disease or building strong immune systems that can help to fight acute illness. We currently have many early treatments that are proving to be effective, like monoclonal antibodies and more new ones on the way. This disease is becoming simil seasonal, similar to the flu, regardless of vax rates. The number in the southern states were higher in the summer, and now they are lower. However, in the Northeast, the numbers are increasing. Vermont has one of the highest vaccination rates, yet the cases are skyrocketing and even 300% higher than November of 2020. Lastly, I want to discuss COVID protocols. Two areas, close contact quarantine procedures and student athlete testing. Many parents have been severely frustrated with their child being required to stay out of school for up to 10 days. They are getting almost no work from the school with maybe a virtual tutor for an hour and getting behind. Our neighbors in Carroll County have instituted the option for close contacts to remain in school as long as they remain asymptomatic, and Montgomery County is starting tests to stay. I would like to know how many close contacts that were required to quarantine ever end up testing positive for COVID and BCS. How many healthy students have we forced to stay out of school? Please rethink this policy. Now for student athletes, why are we only testing the unvaccinated? We know that the vaccines do not stop transmission. In fact, Cal Berkeley's football team that is 99% vaccinated just had an outbreak with 44 members testing positive. The Ottawa Senators hockey team with 100% vaccination, vaccination rate had 40% of the team test positive. The NFL has increased its COVID testing for all players regardless of vaccination status. So again, I ask, why are you only testing athletes that are unvaccinated? Thank you for your time, and I hope you have a great and happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Next, we have Ms. Carol Vidal. Hi. Can you hear me? 
Dear board members and superintendent, it's nice to finally see you in person. I'm a parent who started watching board meetings during the frustrating days of the ongoing school closures last year. During these board meetings, I have heard students, parents, teachers, and administrators ask for more COVID restrictions or less, for more or less focus on SEL, for more or less virtual learning, for replacing overcrowded central schools or not, for opening before Labor Day to f help working parents, or after Labor Day to help farmers. Excuse me, ma'am. Could you please speak with your mask on? Thank you. You get it. I'm not here. No, excuse me, ma'am. Could you please put your mask on okay. over your nose? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not here to ask you for my cookie cutter perfect school because I know you can't please everyone. This is a big district. I'm here to ask you to focus on your mission to educate our children. During the last board meeting, you spent three hours talking about including religious days in the school calendar, a public school calendar. Trying to be inclusive, you discussed Hindu and Muslim holidays that were ignored when including Jewish holidays, only to conclude that maybe you should consult with your community of teachers and even parents, and that serving them takes time, and you actually only have two people in the administration who can do that. Not to stress you more, but you left an entire continent of Africa and all of South America, and also I don't think we have any Native American celebrations in the schedule. And you also um, left out people who welcome longer breaks and less weekly disruption in the schedule so our kids can visit family overseas, or we can have a five-day work week, which is what people with full-time jobs outside in the real world actually have. Will we ever be successful in including all holidays in such a diverse country as the United States? No. Should we as a school system focus on that? No. Research shows that instruction time matters more than any fancy curriculum. Our children are graduating with MCAP proficiency scores in math in the 5%. Half of them are not proficient in reading. And that was before last year's school closures. How are these students going to survive a very competitive world? How does this help kids in your district, Ms. Rowe, or in your district, Ms. Scott, get out of poverty? How does this help families who can pay tutors with working, uh, family, working parents with two or three jobs, hourly paid workers, nurses with schedules that are set months in advance and are given a 10-day notice by the district about a school closure like tomorrow? Excuse me, ma'am. I'd ask. Thank you. These families don't have time to come to these meetings, but they need functioning schools with a predictable schedule. Organizations have no privilege to innovate if we can get the day-to-day -day right and the metrics show that you haven't gotten the day-to-day -day right. We're trying our best during the pandemic and the ransomware attack. This is not the time for extras. It's time to focus on offering what public schools should do best, prepare students with evidence-based practices. Please include academic performance in every board meeting agenda. If we keep the focus on the mission of improving academics, everything else will fall into place, including the schedule. It's time to cancel the noise and get to the real work. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mary Taylor. Good evening. Kids are resilient, we were told. They'll be fine. So what if they stay at home for a year starting, staring at a screen with no interaction with their peers? So what if they were forced to do this when all the science said they should actually be in school? They would bounce right back when the teachers unions finally gave the okay for schools to resume. It would just be that easy. But it turns out the people who have been wrong about everything else are wrong about this too. Myself, members of the Baltimore County Parent and Student Coalition, and many others in the community begged you last year to open schools. We tried to warn you what was happening to our kids during the prolonged closures of school, and we tried to warn you this year was going to be more challenging than the last two years. These kids suffered mental health issues, isolation, neglect, abuse, hunger, instability, and are socially stunted from the one and a half years of school's closures. Our schools are short-staffed, our teachers and classrooms are not able to manage behavioral outbursts, and are reportedly not getting the support from the administrators that they need. Some examples of the out-of-control behavior. Two different middle school students have brought lighters to school and threatened to burn others. Multiple videos of children attacking and punching each other in school, outside of schools, and on buses. One child recently suffered a head injury and needed emergency medical treatment. Keys were stolen from a room at a high school and a student's car was taken from the campus. A sexual assault, assault was performed in an occupied classroom during school hours. 
multiple reports of staff injuries from students, bus drivers and teachers reporting being spit on, cursed at, and physically hurt by students. Trash cans have been set on fire at our schools. Guns on and around our school property have been found. Reported gang activity and drug use in our schools. High schools on lockdown during the fall sports season had to postpone JV and varsity football games because there was taking place on campus because of multiple fights that became out of control. Students being groped and sexually assaulted in the hallways and bathrooms by other students. High school female student had recently had her nose and ankle broken and her eardrum ruptured by another female student and required medical treatment. Learning is not occurring in a consistent, predictable, or safe manner because of all the mentioned contributing factors this year and, and learning needs to be a priority. This is an urgent crisis level. We're not being dramatic or over-exaggerating. These kids need clear and consistent consequences. Make our schools safe again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bash Verone. For decades, the school system has spread biased and misinformation about the Muslim students in Baltimore County Public Schools. That's why the school system closed on the Jewish holiday and nobody else for almost 25 years. Until we had in the PRC, Mr. Steve Virch, Ms. Romaine Williams, and Ms. Kathleen Cozy. And that's the time when PRC has studied the issue of holidays and led to what you see today of professional days for both Muslim and Jewish holidays. I truly honor Ms. Romaine Williams. She believed in equality and equity. She pushed for it. I think she had a lot of pushback and Steve Versch was very verbal and very professional in dissecting the truth from uh, not the truth. Muslim Americans in this county came in huge numbers. As I told you, they filled this room and all the way uh, for several meetings asking for equality. We always came in numbers, but we were treated less than the Jewish holidays. There were never really data to support closing on the Jewish holiday for almost 25 years and not really closing equally on Muslim holidays. And now I think the dilemma we face that on the proposed calendar, you know, our Eid was not really even mentioned. And then we have to fight for it, you know, do we get it on Saturday or do we get it on Monday or Friday? Um, this is really difficult. So it's all about equality, all right? Equal has to be equal. So if we give a day off on the Jewish New Year's, why don't we give a day off on the Chinese New Year? What's special about one and not the other? Why not really give off on the Muslim New Year? All right? If we give two to one religion, why don't we give to equal to the other religion. And I know you have your difficulties. I already praised you. But it has to be two equals two, one equals one, zero equals zero. Otherwise, I mean, you know, why talk about equity and equality? You know, equality has to mean equality. And I, I think the chair has really meant it. When I asked for four. <laughs> Thank you. Next, we have Mr. Mohammed Jamil.
evening. Peace and blessings to everyone present. Thanksgiving Day for, th for giving thanks is upon us. Who do we give thanks to? I believe that we give thanks to the Creator for our parents, spouses, children, siblings, friends, neighbors, colleagues, and educators too. So I want to thank you, Madam Chair, Ms. Scott, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and board members for sacrificing your time and unpaid service to the community. Thank you for trying to uphold the democratic values of our republic. But I'm worried. BBC reported yesterday at 3 p.m. that United Nations human rights expert, Mr. Ferdinand, notified our State Department that United States, for the first time, is now in the list of backsliding democracies. It is because of the new legislations and gerrymandering which are diluting the voting rights of the minorities. There are about nine different times and dates for celebrating Thanksgiving Day in our history. The first one being the Plymouth Feast in 1621, followed by one in March 1776. November 1, 1777 was the presidential Thanksgiving Day proclaimed by Congress. First day of May 1779 was also a Thanksgiving Day. So was 8th November 1781 for signing of the Treaty of Paris. 13th of December was declared as a Thanksgiving Day to celebrate George Washington's victory at Yorktown. He also declared November 26th as the nationwide Thanksgiving Day in 1789, while Abraham Lincoln designated August 6th for the Civil War victories. Now we celebrate fourth Thursday of November as a national Thanksgiving Day promulgated by President Roosevelt in 1939. My statements are not meant to be political. Backsliding of our democracy is the result of the culmination of anti-minority policies and actions starting at the grassroots levels. It is our duty to preserve our democracy by making sure that all men are created equal and they have equal rights. No one has special privileges or the rights. Muslim students deserve celebrations of their New Year Day and their two high holidays equally to the students of the other two Abrahamic faiths. BCPS is in the hierarchy of leadership. Please do not condone or normalize the backsliding of our democracy by denying equal treatment or by rescinding your decision that you made three years ago. By the way, the pilgrims did not have turkey, but some waterfowl like a duck or a goose. <laughs> they also didn't have pumpkin pie. They did have ground corn to be used like rice or barley and roasted and stewed pumpkin. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Ms. Sharon Seraf. raising the bar, closing the gaps, and preparing for our future. How is it that we are raising the bar when we pass students through the grades into high school functioning on or maybe third or fourth grade? How are we closing the gaps when some students are not afforded the same level of teaching as others? And how are we preparing our students for the future if we are not willing to provide the same opportunities for everyone. How are we doing any of the items in this motto contains when we are fine that students with IEPs are passing to the next grade with mostly or all Ds. We talk about learning loss and making up services. I know students who have gone without instruction or more for the entire quarter this year because of lack of teachers. I know students whose instruction has been interrupted several times because of quarantine. I've seen progress reports that feel 40% is sufficient progress. Would you feel that sufficient progress for your child? 
I hope not. Would you feel that's closing the gap and raising the bar? We talk about improving the environment that our students and our teachers feel safe and comfortable to learn. We've heard tonight what's going on in our schools. The violence is picking up, and what are we doing to address it? I'm not really sure if we're doing anything to fix it because bus incidents go unreported, and students are forced into unsafe environments that parents feel uncomfortable in. I'm not seeing improvement when I hear a parent tell me that their child doesn't want to go to school because they're afraid or not learning or something worse, like coming home with a bruise. I recently had a conversation with a school administrator about what is being taught and the progress of a child is making. Let me note, this particular child I was discussing was not making progress. I was told that this child was not expected to comprehend what they were learning, even though they were expected to use it to problem solve. How do you do one without the other? We say actions speak louder than words. I think the actions are not equal to our motto. We need to fix that now. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Tracy Libroom. Ms. Libroom. Okay, we'll go forward to next speaker is Ms. Anna Weisberg. Good evening. My name is Anna Weisberg. I'm a reading teacher at Deep Creek Middle School and a TAPCO board member. I'm here to talk about the staffing problem that we have in BCPS right now. The social emotional needs of the children in my building are on a level I haven't seen in my 20 years of teaching. After a year of social isolation and despite the best efforts of current staff, school-based administration and guardians, we have students roaming the halls during classes, cursing out teachers and each other, yelling sexually explicit content across classrooms and picking fights. In the past three weeks, two of my students have had family members die in stabbings, not at school. I saw an unknown student crying in the hall last Friday. I was on the way to my prep period. What's going on? My mom won't leave her boyfriend and he's not treating her right. What should I have done? Say, that sounds rough and go prepare for the next day's classes, troubleshoot with colleagues, grade student work, make follow-up calls to parents, or walk the student to their guidance counselor and sit with them until their counselor was available. I spent my prep time trying to help the student that I didn't know. The role schools serve in student social and emotional health and development is abundantly clear. Yet, we are being given no tools, trainings, or strategies to meet students' new and growing needs. Addressing students' social, behavioral, and emotional needs is consuming my work days. I have almost no time to confer with colleagues, contact parents, grade, or plan during my work day. And it isn't just me. Everyone I know is doing social, emotional work, from the bus drivers to office staff, teachers, principals, AAs, paras, everyone. The social, emotional needs and the fallout of the pandemic are going to mean that we need more help to meet our students' needs. We need more staff in every job class. All of the staff, not just teachers, need professional development in this area. And we need recognition that a chunk of our workday and beyond is being taken up with other essential work. We need our workload reduced accordingly. If we don't get those supports, there are going to be more resignations, which is going to increase demands on the remaining staff, which will burn us out faster and create more vacancies. 
Now is not the time to further destabilize our students with another wave of mass educator resignations. Our working conditions are our students' growing conditions. We are all here for the children of Baltimore County, and we need more support to do our jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Next is public comment on policy 8221, duties and responsibilities, board officers, chair, vice chair duties, and our first speaker is Ms. Sharon Seraf. don't have a lot to say about this or any of the other policies that I have read about and I'm commenting on tonight, except to say that I would like to see better than what I've seen over the past year. Um, the officers need to lead and they need to be courteous and provide an example for the other board members on actions. And that's not what I have seen. And I'm not afraid to continue to say what I see and what I feel. We can do better and I would like to see better. Thank you, next is Mr. Bash Farone. Thank you. Next is policy 8311, meetings. And again, that's Ms. Sharon Seroff. I think I said what I needed to say. You're not speaking? Okay. Next is Mr. Bash from own policy 8311, meetings. Madam Chair, I'll skip all of them. For You'll skip all of them? Okay. Next is policy 8314, meetings agenda. Again, Ms. Sharon Seroff. Okay, and again, policy 8314, Mr. Bashfrone, you're not speaking to that one? Correct. Correct, okay. Next is policy 8601, use of social media. Again, Ms. Sharon Seroff. Okay, and again, um, policy 8601, Mr. Bashfrone, not speaking to that? Okay. Okay, the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that I call on Mr. Brusades. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Mrs. Scott, and board members. As you know, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to consider an appeal in case number he 21-22, now would be an appropriate time to confirm the board's vote on that appeal. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case H.E. 21 through 22? So moved, Offerman. Is there a second? Second, Mac. Thank you. Any discussion? Okay, and also um, I wanted to make sure that um, also to authorize Ms. Gover to sign on behalf of board members not physically present. Okay, I need to read the motion again. 
I want to read it all together. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on hearing examiner's case H.E. 21 through 22 and to authorize Ms. Gover to sign on behalf of those board members not physically present. Do we need a motion? Yeah. So moved. Second, Mac. Thank you. It was moved again by Mr. Offerman and seconded by Ms. Mack. Okay, is there any discussion or any questions? Okay, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Staying. Dr. Hager? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and next is added the uh, update on transportation as item K that was just added. Sure. So I will ask uh, Dr. Grimm, Dr. Yarbrough, and Mr. Patillo to please come forward at this time. As they are moving, I will just present a portion of my efficiency review that is scheduled to uh, follow later on. If you can go to the PowerPoint at this time. So again, uh, good evening board. Uh, this is a part of my efficiency review. So I will share some information and then I'll turn it back over to the board. So this slide uh, represents Baltimore County Public Schools. And like many other districts across the nation, it's experiencing a shortage with bus drivers and bus attendants. The, the school system recognizes that bus drivers and bus attendants are facing many challenges as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic including increased route coverage and disruptive student behavior. On November 9th of 2021, Baltimore County Executive, County Executive Johnny Ocheski Jr. and I announced a plan to boost recruitment and retention of school bus drivers amid a national shortage that included a $2 increase for all bus drivers and attendants effectively raising the starting hourly rate wage to $18.69 for bus drivers and $13.37 for attendance. Additionally, BCPS bus drivers and attendants are full-time employees with benefits including medical, dental, and vision insurance, urgent personal business and personal illness leave, and are eligible for the Maryland State Retirement. Next slide, please. This slide depicts BCPS commitment to our bus drivers and community during a time of exponential change. In 2019-2020, we committed to a full compensation of bus drivers during virtual learning, and we're grateful for their efforts in transporting meals to schools and communities, supporting student re-engagement, and ensuring a smooth return to hybrid instruction in the spring. We are proud of the innovative efforts to retain all members of Team BCPS and grateful for their partnership in serving our community in new and necessary ways. While the 2021 school year returned to five days a week in person learning was a welcome sign of some sense of normality, pandemic related staffing shortages and supply chain concerns created new challenges. Our bus drivers cover 785 daily route routes with 142 routes covered by contractors. We currently have 120 bus driver and attendant vacancies, 94 drivers and 26 attendants, 44 bus drivers and 21 bus attendants on leave for various reasons, including short term and long term. We are currently operating with all hands on deck approach to fill the gap and continue to maintain service for all routes. Staff in all the positions on this side are taking on routes to ensure full service to BCPS families, substitute bus drivers, 
bus driver trainers, bus driver senior trainers, clerks, routing, assist, routing assistants, dispatchers, field representatives, training supervisors, senior operations supervisors, fleet staff before and after shifts. Additionally, our school teams have created structures to support students awaiting after school transport. With everyone working at a full capacity, call outs that happen when <laughs> buses are due to begin their routes exacerbate our transportation challenges and have a direct impact on the service students and families receive. While some districts have increased the walker radius and reduced routes to combat this problem, it is our preference to continue to provide services to all families who currently receive them. Next slide. We are committed to meeting the needs of our students and finding creative ways to address the bus driver shortage issues and focusing our efforts on recruitment, compensation, and retention. In the recruitment area, the Division of Human Resources has hosted several targeted job fairs to attract candidates. As a direct result of their efforts, we currently have 41 drivers in the pipeline and 11 drivers in attendance in the pre-employment process. In collaboration with the county government, pre-employment barriers are being removed to ensure a streamlined onboarding process. This includes no-cost fingerprinting, physical exams, drug testing, and sleep apnea testing. The Division of Human Resources and the Office of Purchasing will be moving forward with a request for proposal process to bring additional drivers aboard to help us address our vacancies. Additionally, current Current employees have the opportunity to earn referral bonuses and new employees will earn sign-on bonuses. In terms of compensation, as indicated earlier, all drivers and operators now receive an increase of $2 per hour for all shifts work, including overtime. While this is for the remaining of the school year, we are currently in the negotiations for upcoming school year and have committed to permanent salary adjustments. ASHME staff will also receive a 2% COLA beginning in January. There's also the retention bonus of $1,000 and the monthly attendance bonus for on-time attendance every day. And finally, the retention. To improve work conditions for current drivers and attendants, we are partnering with them to ensure a safe and positive work climate as they transport our students. To that end, staff has met with the divisions of school support and achievement and staff in the climate and school safety to review the process for communicating bus behavior concerns and disposition to the drivers and attendants. We will be reconvening our transportation work group that includes county government, bus driver and attendant representatives, county government and school leadership to discuss and problem solve innovative solutions. We will continue to partner with county government to explore additional options that support our ongoing transportation efforts. Next slide. Throughout this challenge, the transportation team has adopted a new system to communicate bus changes and delays to schools, which in turn communicate to families. We recognize that this is an imperfect system, and we are working to realize the goal of real time transportation updates to the public. The shortage of drivers, drivers on leave, and daily callouts require the Office of Transportation to combine, double back, triple back, and find other creative ways to safely transport students to and from school on a daily basis. Our limited technology precludes timely communication and for transportation to leverage electronic routing information to provide real-time updates. In respect to school sa bus safety, I'd like to take this opportunity to provide you and the members of the public with reassurance that the Office of Transportation is in compliance with Colmar standards regarding annual inspections and often exceeds them. The Office of Transportation's fleet maintenance staff takes tremendous pride in their work and would never knowingly put a bus in service that jeopardizes the safety of our students, staff members, and other motorists. Our hope is to be able to move forward with the Office of Transportation School Bus and Student Safety Initiative in partnership with the Baltimore County Government and Baltimore County Police Department to further increase student safety and provide access to advanced technology supporting school bus operations, including exterior stop arm cameras, new interior bus cameras, 
and a mobile and web-based information portal application, <coughs> among other features. We look forward to providing additional transportation update next month. This time, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Are there any questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Mack? Thank you for that information, Dr. Williams. Um, my questions are about the issues that have just been um, brought to our attention in the news about the buses um, with the repair issues. I'd like to know what the processes are for ongoing proactive preventative maintenance, bus maintenance, and emergency repairs. And I'd like to know if these process or ma processes are mandated in any way by Comar, by the MVA, or by the Department of Transportation. Dr. Grimm, would you be able to provide some of those answers? And if not, we'll be able to circle back again next month. But go ahead. Certainly. I think I can provide um, at least part of part of your answers to part of your questions, Ms. Mack. Um, we participate, as, as Comar stipulates, in four uh, mandated inspections each school year. Um, there are three type B inspections and one type A inspection that occur each year. The difference between the type B inspections and the type A inspections is that the type B inspections are, are basically done on the ground, which means that um, they are, it's, it's a visual inspection along with um, it, interacting with, with certain bus features. Um, the type A puts the bus up on a lift okay. and includes um, looking at the, at the brakes and the wheels, taking the wheels off, so th that it's a different type of inspection. Um, in addition to those, we are mandated to keep a spare fleet, which we, ha which we have and our contracted partners have as well. Our spare fleet um, has been a little bit larger over the past several years. We've actually been taking some uh, steps because of the efficiency review to reduce those numbers as best that we can. Our spare fleet right now is about 15% of our fleet. So when we have a vehicle that we question any of the safety features on, we will take that vehicle out of service and we do have a spare that, that we can put in its place. Um, in general, and I believe this was part of your question, if a driver has a concern about their vehicle, um, there's a form that they complete um, there are mechanics and other fleet staff on site at each one of our bus lots. They submit that form to the uh, appropriate fleet staff. Depending on what the issue is, that bus will be taken out of service immediately at that time, or it will be deemed that it can be something that can be repaired when they bring it back to the light. So for example, if a bus driver determines that a tail light is broken, before they go out on their run as part of their pre-trip pre inspection, the fleet staff will immediately take that out of service. That's considered a major defect. It can't go out on the road, and we would replace that before it hits the road. Um, so we, we, have, we have regular processes in place to, to take care and, and address maintenance issues. Okay, I have one follow-up question. Um, the MBA has ordered an inspection of all BCPS buses since I've just learned about type A and type B, will these be type A or type B inspections? So they're, they're actually uh, dubbing it a random inspection okay. that, they're, that they're doing. Uh, that process has already been underway. Um, the MVA was, was M.MVA MVA was out on site and worked with our staff on Friday to look at some of our records. On Monday yesterday, they actually began the inspection process at two of our lots, and we're at two different lots uh, today, and they'll continue that inspection next week. And do we anticipate this inspection process having any impact on our ability to deliver bus service to our students? Absolutely not. Um, in fact, for the, for the past two days, um, as a result of yesterday's inspections and today's, there, there have been no abnormalities or buses taken out of service that wouldn't normally occur during the course of an inspection in which they participate. So M.MVA, out of those four inspections that I mentioned, they only attend one of those type Bs each year. Um, and our staff actually do, do the, the inspection, and you, typically M.NVA monitors our staff as they go through that process. In this random inspection that they've done the past two days, our staff is on site to assist them in, in starting up the bus and to move them around, but M.NVA is actually completing the inspections. 
my last question is, do we expect there to be any material findings at the conclusion of the MVA MDOT inspections? We don't expect that there are gonna be any material findings other than what any normal in inspection would find. Um, so for example, on, on any given day, they might find, uh, like I said, a, a, a light is broken or there or there's some other issue or, or some other what they call a defect um, outside of those normal uh, defects so to speak we we don't anticipate there to be anything out of order thank you very much for your time and for answering my questions you're welcome i just want to add to and, and dr williams said it our our fleet technicians take tremendous pride in their work um, they would never ever put a bus out in service knowingly with, with any type of a defect that they believe would jeopardize the safety of our students. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Yes, Mr. McMillian. A couple of weeks ago, we heard a lot about shift differential, but during the presentation, I, unless I missed it, I didn't see anything mentioned about shift differential. I, th I think there's a lot of confusion out there whether that $2 is $2 across the board to everybody or whether the $2 is for anybody doing runs up and above their normal, their normal number of runs. Can somebody explain that to me in the public? So I'll start and I'll turn it over to the team. In the presentation, we did talk about the $2 differential. And based on the vacancies, we're finding many of our bus drivers and attendants have to cover and to do double and triple runs. But Dr. Graham or Mr. Patillo, you want to add anything additional? And Dr. Yarbrough as well. So Mr. McMillian, to respond to your question, I, I think where some confusion may occur in, in my conversation with our bus drivers and bus attendants as well, it's that term shift differential, as is noted in, in the, the AFSCME master agreement. Um, what, what is noted in the MOU between AFSCME and the board um, regarding the additional two hour pay, it's noted as Dr. Williams said, that it's recognized that staff is doing additional work during their shift. So for each hour, they're being compensated an additional two hours. I think the term shift differential is confusing because it's used uh, one way to, to represent a second or a third shift in the master agreement, but in this case, it's being used to recognize that there is a difference in the normal shift that they would perform. As Dr. Williams said, we have staff that are, that are doubling, tripling back, combining routes and what have you, and in recognition of that, it's my understanding that this $2 an hour pay increase um, is, is meant to, to recognize those efforts. Okay, let's suppose that somebody's working, their normal load is nine runs a day. And that's what they started with in September. Are they getting the $2 or are they not getting the $2? So it's my understanding that each, that every bus operator, so that would be an individual who is, who is performing the actions of a bus driver is going to receive that additional compensation for hours worked. Okay, great, thank you. And one other idea, I wanna follow this through. So we have 785 runs, subtract the contractor's runs, minus 142, so we get 643 runs. We're missing 94, we have 94 driver vacancies, it puts us down to 549 drivers, it appears. Can somebody tell me how many drivers have 10 years vented in the system or vested in the system so they could retire? Uh, we will get that information. I, I don't have that data available this evening. Mr. McMillian, but I'm sure we could get, we can take a look at how many okay. drivers have so 10 I'm, plus I'm just years. really concerned if we lose a portion of those people, then we're going to, you know, then it's a, more of a crisis than it already is. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Yes, looks like there's a question from Ms. Causey. Good evening. Thank you for that presentation. I had sent an email on um, Tuesday, November 16th uh, to board to the board and uh, Dr. Williams and staff and regarding a PIA that was done by a parent requesting information on her student's bus situation. And part of that letter said that there is not data available due to the ransomware attack. If uh, staff could please ex clarify what information is not available um, and whether it is 
unavailable to be restored or whether it has not been a priority to be restored. Would you be able to respond to that? Dr. I'm not familiar with what PEIA request is being referred to or what, or what data is being referred to. Um, I'd be happy to try to answer the question if I had that To the lateness of buses and be able to determine arrival time, if late, what that might be. And I mentioned about the lack of technology, but it's something around in that area. So prior, prior to the ransomware attack, um, we did have internally through BCPS Inform um, a mechanism that the Office of Transportation was vetting regarding on-time arrival as a result of the ransomware attack. Um, that, that process was skewed. It, it integrated our, um, our GPS systems with, um, uh, I guess some coding would be the, be would be the best word or, or uh, data transfer and, and data analysis that was done that could give us windows of on-time arrival. Um, I don't know much about how the back end of that worked, but we did internally have some data around that. It was not fully vetted by our office at that time because there were a number of inconsistencies with the manner in which it was measured. Um, that has not been stood back up at this time. I don't have any other information to share. Uh, Dr. Williams, could you clarify whether uh, what the IT impact is, whether it's still possible to retrieve that data? I am not unable to clarify that. We'll be able to go back and do some more research. Um, but the plan to move forward was to really look at the technology, not only with the safety, but also to go back and to get that on-time arrival, at least to predict um, when buses are late, how late they may be in that communication. But I don't have that information at this time, Ms. Causey. So when you mentioned the lack of technology for communication, can you expand on that, whether it's to parents or principals? Well, in my presentation, I talked about the way we are adopting a new system to communicate to our schools so, fa so schools can communicate to families. But I also talked about the need to expand on that technology so we can improve that communication and the timeliness and to track arrival and uh, dismissal of, of, of buses. But at this point, that's all we have at this time. Again, I'm happy to go back and work with the team to see if we can retrieve additional information as we provide an update later. Well, that would be very helpful because we are getting um, a lot of communication from parents and um, certainly our principals are impacted and our teachers when the buses don't arrive on time and uh, the, that that should be <clears throat> prioritized in finding a solution um, for anything that can help with our transportation. Dr. Williams, may I make a comment as well? Um, so the, the system that we did have in place that we were looking at internally for on-time arrival um, presented us in, in data um, in, in past time. So it was, it was not helpful in the real time of determining what was on time and what was not. It was, it was not data that we could use in that regard. It was lagging data. We had to use it after the event in order to go back and analyze what had happened. Some of the technology we're looking at moving forward will give us data in real time to be able to communicate with our schools and, and with the public some issues that we might have around that um, eventually as we gear up. I think it's also important to note that at present, um, in terms of communication with our buses, except for our 25 radio buses, we don't have um, we don't even have two-way radios where our drivers can communicate back with our bus lots. Uh, we're in the process of having those installed and our IT department is working with us on that project, um, but that is also a deficiency that we have. So when we speak about communication, I think it's a, a much broader and larger picture in terms of student safety that we're referring to. And speaking of the technology, what is the status of the routing software implementation and impacts from the ransom attack on that? Uh, so our, the routing 
software, the routing software that we've uh, that we've used in the past, we um, with the the approval of the board and, and with our IT folks have moved that um, into a, a it's a web based program. It's the same program that we have, and we have been fully functional with that um, since the springtime. Um, recently, that system we can use our routing software now speaks with focus so there is a data exchange that schools now have where they can see our bus information and focus as well and what information is that uh, they could see a uh, student's bus assignment they can make adjustments to it so they can determine what transportation is assigned to an individual So when principals hear that bus 678 is missing uh, or late, then they can alert those parents because they know who those students are. Is that what you're saying? That information is there? Uh, that's correct. They do have access to that information. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, I want. I would like to go back to the topic of uh, bus safety uh, quickly. I just had some follow-on questions from uh, what Ms. Mack had started. Um, you mentioned that the MVA is doing random inspections. Are they doing a random sample, or are they going to inspect all of uh, VCPS's buses? Uh, that's an outstanding question, Mr. Kuhn, and one that s I simply can't answer. Um, I know that so far they have um, the lots that they've come to, the four lots that they've come to, they have uh, selected specific buses out of our 4,000 series buses to conduct inspections on them. Uh, we have a schedule for where they'll be next week um, and intend to support them then. Beyond that, we don't know at this time the uh, scope of, of their inspection. All right, thank you for that. Um, are they targeting a buses of a certain age and older or are you aware of, of what they're targeting or how they're going about their the process? Uh, we believe that they are, are targeting a, um, or beginning with, I shouldn't use the word targeting, they are, they are beginning with um, a certain type of bus and a certain, um, so a certain style of bus and a certain bus manufactured within a certain span of years. Okay, and uh, just uh, for informational purposes, can you kind of describe the age of the fleet that we're dealing with? Like, I know, you know, we, we buy buses. Uh, we, I know we just passed a large contract or spending for a contract uh, within the last six months, and it was significant um, in, in dollar amount. And I know it's just con constant, right, because we constantly need buses. So can you, can you describe what our fleet looks like age-wise? Absolutely, and, and that's a great question, Mr. Kuhn, in, in terms of having a bird's eye view of our, um, of our school buses. So uh, school buses in the state of Maryland have a lifespan of 12 years. We can ask for an extension um, for a maximum of three years um, in one year increments for those buses. For safety reasons, it has not been BCPS's practice to extend the life of those buses. Um, we have done so this year because of the supply chain and our new buses uh, are just now arriving, quite honestly. So we do have some buses that um, have been waived uh, by MDOT MVA for their 13th year. Um, over the course of those 12 years, Mr. Kuhn, um, the uh, number of buses that we have been purchasing varies each year, depending on the, the style and the size and, and how many were in the last cycle. However, my team has worked extremely hard to try to standardize the number that we're buying each year to build in some consistency. So in that 12 year cycle previously, there were some years where we were buying um, around 50 buses and, and other years where we were buying over 100. We've standardized that where, where we've looked at our fleet, again, as part of the efficiency review. Um, we've reduced the side of, of our spare fleet, but still uh, at the recommended level. And we will be purchasing approximately 72 new school buses each 
year, um, we believe for the next several years, um, to right size and to cycle through our fleet. Um, it's important to note that these uh, buses range in size and shape. Um, we have everything from 48 passenger school buses um, to 77 passenger school buses. We have um, buses that can accommodate multiple wheelchairs. We have some that accommodate none at all. Um, and we also have uh, some, some uh, multifunction vehicles that we'll be looking at in the future as uh, some of the Comar guidelines are, are changed as well. Um, so we do have a, a variety in our fleet uh, to service our community. In some of our communities, we can't fit a 77 passenger bus, for example, so we rely on some of our smaller buses, our 48 passenger or our 64 passenger vehicles. All right, thank you. And I'm gonna ask two quick questions here. One, um, how many buses do we have overall on our fleet? Uh, I, I believe that number is uh, 838. And you, and you have to forgive me, that might be That's plus, okay. or, plus or minus a couple, but eight, 838 is a number I'm confident in. Thanks, I, I would just like to know around how many. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, my last question is around our schedule of inspections. You said we do four a year, three B, one A. Where are we in our cycle? Do you do this quarterly, or how do you do this? So we just we just finished a um, we just finished a B cycle in October. We have an A and our A cycle is about to kick up in December. We will have another B cycle in March, and we will have our final B cycle in June. Typically, it's that May June B cycle that MDOT MVA participates in with us. All right, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for that. I, are there additional questions? Oh, yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, and thank you, Dr. Graham, and all, all three of you for your dedication to transportation. I know that it's been rough, but uh, I really do appreciate you still coming to work every day and trying to make our transportation better. Um, I have a question. So how was it communicated to students and families that a bus will not be arriving on time in the morning? I think it was touched on, but I just wanted to ask it again. So typically, typically speaking, um, we, we have uh, three buckets, as Dr. Williams pointed out. We have our, um, we have our vacancies, which each, each lot and each area has a number of, of vacancies. We have folks that we know who are out on leave, and then we have call-outs that range from day to day. So under our current operational paradigm, every day our lots are, are starting at a deficit. They know that they've got open trips that they need to cover, um, beginning with our high schools, transitioning to our middle schools and then our elementary schools. What complicates matters is when you have somebody out on leave um, that's, that isn't on leave today, is on leave tomorrow, and we need to, to address their route. But it's those call outs. It's those things that happen the morning of as service already starts or after service has already begun and um, we, don't, we, we don't know until after the fact that we need to cover something. So uh, typically what occurs is that our, um, our teams are organizing what the different covered what the different coverages are um, they list those out um, it's it's kind of a big grid to visualize in, in your in your head with all the bus numbers what all the schools are um, each route is um, is made up of several bus trips as I said it might be a high school a middle school and one or two elementaries. It might be a special needs school and, and, and only two of those. It might be a school that's very far away so we can only do one at the beginning and one at the end. We, we tier those together so that they fit as best they can. What happens when we need to cover is we try to pull the pieces of the routes that we need to cover and combine them with other trips. As Dr. Williams noted, sometimes that means combining busloads of students together. Sometimes it means doubling back, sometimes it means tripling back. Our staff is trying to organize that simultaneously while getting ready to begin service. So all this is happening in the very wee hours of the morning, um, and we're trying to get that communication out to our schools. Our goal has been, as we've moved to this new system, that uh, our schools, our high schools receive them 
uh, no later than 7.15 in the morning. And Christian, you may look at me because you're a high school student, say 7.15, that's crazy. <laughs> I know students that get picked up at 6 a.m. Well, unfortunately, at 6 a.m., we don't always have all the information we need to get that, to get that out to our families. Um, so in terms of the high schools, we do our best to communicate that information out, and then they, they're able to share that with their families, whether it's through school messenger or some other means that, that they have. Um, we're a little bit more efficient with our middle schools and our elementary schools um, because we have, a little bit, we have a little bit more time. I think the trick as well, um, if I may, is that all of our lot staff, um, even our customer service clerks, are, are often out on buses. Um, they're serving as bus attendants. Um, they're supporting our lots in, in other ways. Some are even driving. Um, our operations supervisors are out as well. So those, those lots are empty. They can't take some of those parent calls or address those issues if um, something happens. We, we have bus accidents that happen. We have other issues that occur. And so those also confound our ability to cover our routes. Okay, and so if I'm a student who's at a bus stop and my bus isn't here, it's been 30, 40 minutes and I haven't received communication from my school yet, what should I do? I think that's a great question, Christian, and I, I think that's one that we often say, have a plan with your parents, work with your parents. Um, if you look at our policies and rules um, about bus stops, really the, um, the uh, management of, of a student basically at a bus stop is under our policy and rule the responsibility of the parent. And I think that there needs to be a plan there. Hey, what, what, what do you want me to do, mom? What do you want me to do, dad, if this, is, if this is what occurs when I'm at the bus stop? And could students contact, say, their school community and contact their principal to ask for updates? They is sure that, can. Is that a recommendation that the, students have? Absolutely, and they can also contact our main call center and that number is 443-809-4321. Um, we, are, we are manned, I, I could say it again, 443-809-4321. We have staff at the call center beginning at 6 a.m. and they're typically there till 5.30 p.m. or until we've cleared in the evening. Okay, and thank you so much. And uh, yeah, just thank you. Thank you, any additional questions? Yes, Mr. McMillian. I'd just like to point out that last spring or early summer, when I was getting my uh, air brake endorsement, Mr. Grimm was going through, Dr. Grimm was going through the CDL process. He passed the test, correct? Yes. He is a licensed driver himself, and I'd like the people to realize that. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Matt, I mean, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. So you said earlier that our lot operations managers are out driving buses, so they can't take calls. Is that what I heard you say? That's correct. Uh, um, essentially, all of our staff at our, at, at our operations lots are out on the road uh, morning and afternoon every day. So who's there to do the jobs of those people if they're out driving buses? Uh, they, they do them as best they can when they have time, uh, midday or after their shift, uh, after their trips end at the end of the day. And, and that works okay for you guys? Or maybe like, should the, how come you don't have office staff to work in the office and then well, have drivers who drive? And then if, if your operations people who have CDLs have to go out and drive, are there not office people who then can at least answer the phone? So our, our number one priority, Ms. Rowe, is to get our kids safely to and from school every day. So it, it has been an all hands on deck approach to get to, to make that happen. So that's why our, our staff, even our, even our fleet staff before and after their shift, some of them have, have volunteered to, to take trips. So they drive um, before or, or after their shift to work on buses. And so yes, we do have, we do have staff that are out um, all the time. So do you only hire office staff if they have a CDL? We do, we do not, but our operations supervisors, our field representatives, our dispatchers, our routing assistants all need to have that experience. Our customer service clerks are the only ones that do not. Some of them do um, have that. Some of those folks are out serving as bus attendants. 
when they when they can to help fill in. So on any given day, your office staff could not be in the office and could be out driving buses. That's that's correct. During during peak times in the morning and in the afternoon for AM and PM service. And do we have a plan to hire more office staff? Well, I think the the uh, trick that we have is if we can get more drivers on the road, then we can have our office staff doing some of the things that they need to do to fulfill those responsibilities. Our routing assistants, for example, are paid the same rate as our bus drivers, but they're the ones that directly communicate with our schools, so they have additional responsibilities. Um, they also work over the summer, but between their routes, because they are driving full routes in the morning and the afternoon, they're trying to work with our schools to, to add and manage many of those stops as well. Okay, so the people who are in the office, who are not in the office, who are out driving buses, are the same people whose job it is to notify schools if buses are going to be late. How do the schools know where the buses are if the people who are supposed to tell them are driving buses and none of the buses have radios so they can tell the parents the bus is going to be late? So again, that's when we would recommend that folks use our, our call center line. And what we do have is we do have uh, GPS on those buses and we can track them centrally. Um, and we often give parents and schools that information of where those buses are. Um, I believe I did mention we do have about 25 buses. We call them our radio buses that do have those radios. Those staff that you're mentioning that are the staff that work at the lots, we can contact them on their buses to find out where something is or who's covering something or what's going to happen if there's an accident and a different uh, additional coverage is needed. Is this the way this always operates or is this just something you're doing this year because of the low staffing? Uh, this is not our ideal operations. And, and we're hoping with um, being able to hire additional bus drivers that um, we will be able to alleviate some of the, the, the stressors on a number of our operation staff. So the phone number that you gave us, someone will always answer that phone? Yes, ma'am. That's, that's in our central call center in Pulaski Park. And again, that's, uh, there's staff there from 6 a.m. until 5.30 p.m. at least. And will there ever be a time they don't have access to the information because somebody's not in the lot offices? Um, sometimes there, there is information that we, that we can't get, that we try to get while folks are on the road. Um, sometimes, Ms. Rowe, we're in a situation these days where we don't have an immediate answer about something that is being covered. Um, for example, uh, if we have a, a bus accident that happens and there obviously no coverage was assigned for that particular bus, or sometimes we are communicating to schools on um, really heavy days with high numbers of callouts, we don't yet know who's going to cover that bus but we have a plan as we clear a particular school or set of feeder patterns, we'll ensure that we get back to service those students. Okay, so someone will always answer the phone, but that person may not have an answer to whatever it is the parent needs to know. Not always. Okay, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. It's time, yes, and it looks like there is a question from Ms. Causey. Thank you. Real quickly, um, safety is uh, best, uh, you know, created when parents and principals and students have knowledge, and that will allow them to plan for that student's safety um, and possibly another route to school if it's going to be such a long time. Uh, so that's a statement, but also a question of how quickly can we increase the communication bandwidth of our um, bus driver in your department. So please let the board know how we can help. And the other is the attendance. That's time, Ms. Causey. That Ms. Causey, that's time. Thank you. Were there any other board members that had questions in regards to this? I just want to um, acknowledge Dr. Grimm. For those who don't remember, he started his role in 2019 um, and was very passionate and, of course, almost a few months later, we were impacted by the pandemic. But I also want to acknowledge 
as, as Mr. McMillian said, what you see here is all hands on deck when it comes to transportation. I do want to acknowledge Mr. Patillo and the reason why Dr. Yarbrough is here. Uh, she is filling in, as you recall, that Dr. Scriven used to be the chief. So she's filling in with transportation. And the three of them have been working on this. We're happy to provide another update on our progress, particularly I just want to end on the work that HR has done to look at hiring additional bus drivers and bus attendants. And it's almost like a domino effect, but I do want to acknowledge that. And hopefully by next month, looking at Ms. Anderson, we'll be able to provide an update on the status of those bus drivers and bus attendants. I just want to thank you all for being available and present during this time. Thank you very much. The next item on the agenda is consideration of the 2022-2023 school calendar. And for that, I call on Mr. Duke. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm returning this evening in response to the board's request for revised calendar options. And I have a presentation and I'll wait until it's up. Next slide, please. Board policy and superintendent's rule 6301 requires that a calendar committee be convened annually. Informing the calendar committee, we seek to have a representative cross-section of BCPS offices and stakeholders to guarantee that all perspectives are considered as the calendar is discussed. The committee is comprised of five school principals, representatives from our five collective bargaining units, representatives from various BCPS offices to include curriculum and instruction, organizational effectiveness, student data, transportation, and research accountability and assessment. Representatives from our stakeholder groups are also invited and include our area advisory committees, the PTA Council, the Gifted and Talented Advisory Committee, our Special Education Citizens Advisory Committee, the Career and Technology Education Advisory Council, and the BCPS Student Council President. Superintendent's Rule 6301 requires the committee to be appointed no later than 16 months prior to the school year for which the committee is making the calendar recommendation so that the board may adopt the calendar at its first public meeting in November. Next slide, please. The committee is convened twice, usually in the May-June timeframe. Committee members are provided in advance with copies of the applicable provisions of the education article, COMAR, board policy and rule, MSDE testing calendars, draft calendars, and any other relevant information for their review. In developing the calendar, open discussion takes place where issues are identified and concerns are discussed. The committee also ensures that all options being considered abide by the guidelines established in the education article and COMAR. Next slide, please. As I stated earlier, the calendar is developed ensuring that state guidelines are met. The education article and COMAR establish the length of the school year, identify the public school holidays to be observed, set the minimum number of student contact hours that must be met, and the number of emergency closure days that must be incorporated into the calendar. Next slide, please. Both the minimum number of school days and the minimum number of contact hours must be met annually by all Maryland school systems. School calendars must contain a minimum of 180 student days, offering elementary and middle school students 1,080 contact hours and high school students 1,170 contact hours. Because up until the 2021 school year, our student instructional day was only six and a half hours, BCPS had to build an additional day into its calendar for high schools in order to meet the minimal number of high school student hours and have a cushion of additional hours to absorb any unplanned delayed starts and early dismissals. 
Also, it should be noted that because elementary schools were closed for their conference day, our calendars always had an extra day for middle and high school, which did not close. Since the calendar options presented to the board at its November 9th meeting reflected this approach, it will continue to serve as the starting point for this presentation and for our discussion this evening. Next slide, please. In addition to establishing the minimum number of student days and contact hours, the education article also spells out which holidays are to be observed in Maryland's public schools and included in all school calendars. These holidays are listed here on this slide and equate to 20 school days. Next slide, please. At its November 9th meeting, the board was presented with the calendar committee's recommendation and two calendar options, one with a pre-Labor Day and another with a post-Labor Day start. Upon reviewing the proposals, the board requested additional information about other Maryland school systems and also asked for a revised calendar options incorporating additional professional development days. Next slide. While there are a few LEAs that have posted their 22-23 school calendars, the majority are only now beginning the calendar adoption process. As reported at the last board meeting, for the 21-22 school year, there were 16 LEAs with pre-Labor Day calendars and eight with post-Labor Day starts. As of yesterday, only a few school systems had posted their 22-23 calendars. Of those, three had adopted pre-Labor Day starts, while one other school system adopted a post-Labor Day calendar. Two other ALEAs had proposed post-Labor Day calendars, but yet had not adopted them. The remaining 18, to include BCPS, have neither proposed nor adopted a school calendar for 2022-2023. Next slide. The calendar proposals presented this evening include five additional professional development days that coincide with the holidays listed on this slide. Per the board's direction, for those holidays falling on a weekend, the professional development day was scheduled for either the preceding Friday or the following Monday. Professional development days for Rosh Hashanah, the MSCA conference day, and Yom Kippur were already built into the calendar options that were presented previously to the board. Next slide, please. <clears throat> In addition to the requested professional development days, both calendars include a closure day for elementary schools, as well as five scheduled early releases for all students in all schools. All closures and all hours in which students are not in school must be taken into consideration when computing student days and student contact hours. The next two slides look at the two calendar options presented, taking all these factors into consideration. Next slide, please. Both calendar options are exactly alike except for the start and end dates for the school year. All state mandated requirements have been met and all requested professional development days have been included in both calendars. Both options have included five emergency closure days. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, both the pre and the post Labor Day calendars are based on 180 days for elementary schools and 181 days for middle and high schools. The additional professional development days, however, in these two calendar options have resulted in these calendars exceeding the contractual maximum of 191 teacher days. Next slide. The previous slide looked at the two calendar options from the perspective of student days. This slide examines the calendars in terms of days and student hours. Since both calendars are based on the same number of student days, both are alike in student contact hours. With the 15 additional minutes added to our instructional day this year, 
our margin of high school contact hours has increased to 36.75 hours. Next slide. The calendar options presented tonight incorporate the board's request for additional professional development days. The addition of these days for teachers to those calendar options, however, has taken them beyond the maximum number of teacher days as prescribed in the TABCO master agreement. Therefore, besides deciding on whether to start the school year prior to or after Labor Day, the board must also determine how it would like to adjust the calendars presented to make them compliant with our teacher contract while meeting all state requirements. Next slide. This final slide provides options available to the board. There has been healthy conversation and much appreciated public input, which was carefully reviewed. Some calendars submitted basically coincided with those presented, while others did not consider all requirements, such as holiday closures mandated by our labor contracts. Therefore, some were off by a few student and teacher days. All, however, were reviewed and given consideration. As I mentioned earlier in this presentation, we are required to meet both the minimum number of student hours and the minimum of 180 student days. In the past, BCPS has had to be very cognizant of high school student contact hours because the student instructional day was only six and a half hours. Merely meeting the minimum 180 student days for all schools provided BCPS with no margin of high school student hours to absorb unscheduled delayed openings early releases. As a result, our calendars were created with at least 181 middle and high school student days and no planned early releases for high schools. With the additional 15 minutes this school year, this concern has been ameliorated. With a 6.75 hour student day in 180 days, we will have a margin of 30 student hours, whereas in the past, we would have had none. Therefore, the first option available to the board is reducing the planned number of days for high schools to 180 from the 181 shown in the calendar options. In doing this, the calendar will meet the required 1,170 high school student hours, the state required 180 student days, and the contractual maximum of 191 teacher days. If the board chooses to maintain the 181 high school student days, modifications to the proposed calendar options will have to be made in order not to exceed the 191 contractual teacher days. These options include adjusting the report date for school-based teachers and staff, closing schools for students and school-based staff on October 21st, 2021, reversing the decision to observe holidays that fall on weekends as PD days, or engage with TAPCO and ESPBC to discuss the possibility of extension of the school year for teachers and paras by one day and paying all TAPCO and ESPBC affected staff accordingly. Of course, it must be said that anything to do with the calendar and the last day of the school year is contingent upon the weather and unforeseen circumstances and how that may result in unexpected closures and adjustments to the student day. This concludes my presentation, and I'll be happy to entertain your questions. Thank you. And it looks like there's some discussion of questions from board members. Uh, first, we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dukes. I, I really appreciate this presentation. It puts it in um, an easily consumable format, because this is a complicated matter uh, with days and hours and teacher days and, and student days. So my first question for you is uh, specific. So I'm on slide 12 um, and I'm looking at uh, student days slash hours. And I'm trying to marry it up and understand something. So um, on a shortened day, uh, does that count as a full day for staff? It's, it is one of the 192 days. Um, any of the days that are scheduled as early releases count as student days. 
However, you have to go ahead and deduct the three hours um, of the early release from the total number of hours um, that's of the contact hours for students. Right, but if I'm counting um, uh, teacher days, because you, you said we're, we're, we're over the number of days that we contractually obligated for teachers at this point in time, right? Um, are those considered a full day for teachers? Are they supposed to come in and work an entire day when kids go home a half day early? They are considered as teacher days. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and it, it, th th my final question um, is going to be around the the, the final item you have on page 14, it says possible adjustments uh, associated with this. And you say negotiate for additional day and pay staff accordingly. So what you're telling us is if we go, if, if teachers would agree to it and we went an extra day, one extra day, it's going to cost us $8.9 million. That's correct. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. Mr. Duke, I um, echo Mr. Kuhn's sentiment, um, sentiments. This was very, very helpful and I appreciate it. Um, w could both the calendars as presented require the addition of one additional day if all emer emergency closure days are used to cover tomorrow being an excused day? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Um, uh, Could you restate your never question? Never mind. I just I heard the answer. Never mind. <laughs> well, no, actually, never mind. I won't ask for this year. Um, <laughs> so on page 14, to each of the outlined options, are they individual options that will solve the problem, or do is there a combination that would solve the problem? If we adopt any of them, or do we have to adopt a few of them? No, I believe that they're all standalone options. So the reason I asked, this morning we received an email from a teacher who pointed out that we have never closed um, on the Friday before or the Monday after a Jewish holiday. Um, if the holiday fell on the weekend, it was observed on the weekend, and there was no change made to the Friday before or Monday after. That's correct. When we were closing, when we closed, when the school system closed on the Jewish holidays, uh, if the holiday fell on a weekend, we did not observe it during the school week. So I voted for Mr. Thomas's motion involving the Friday before and the Monday after holidays. But the aforementioned, aforementioned teacher's email makes me realize that we, we have not been equitable. I mean, we've not been equitable in many ways, but by closing the Friday before or the Monday after now, um, it's not something that we've done in the past for holidays that have fallen on the weekend. Is that correct? When a holiday fell on a weekend, we did not observe it. Okay. However, um, the closures that we have are for students only, and they are professional development days where teachers are on duty. And because of that, because teachers are on duty and students are not, that creates an issue with the number of student teacher days versus student days. I have to think about that for a minute. Um, talking about teacher duty days, the second bullet on page 14 speaks to teacher duty days. Do we know the impact on the school preparation that takes place the week before school to receive students if we have staff report for duty one day later? There's always an impact. Based on the comments that you heard earlier this evening, time is a very precious commodity to teachers. So anything that, that uh, infringes upon the available time that a teacher may have um, in preparation for the beginning of school obviously does have an impact. Okay, thank you very much. And again, thank you for this presentation. Thank you. Next is um, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, responding to Ms. Mack's question or comment about uh, not recognizing the holidays on weekdays, if we're looking exclusively at the 2022 to 2023 year calendar, uh, both of the Jewish holidays are during weekdays, and so they would be recognized, whereas the 
one of the Jewish ho- or one of the uh, Muslim holidays is uh, on a weekend, so it wouldn't be recognized. Uh, so recognizing it on the Friday prior or the Monday following, I think, is a good thing to do. Um, as for the first suggestion on slide 14, reducing the planned middle and high school student days from 181 to 180, Mr. Duke, uh, could we close or uh, close the school? Close school on the day before Thanksgiving of that school year, and that would create that or modify that issue the day that was a c- conference day for elementary school teachers. Uh, I don't think that, that would solve the problem. Um, it would also impact the number of of um, of student days and hours, um, and it would take us below the 180. You mean with 181? Yeah, the 181 from because it's already a, a, a day off for our elementary school students. So then, if we take the conference day and make that a school closure, then it would be 180 for 180 days for elementary school students, middle school students, and high school students. Um, and then we wouldn't have the conference day that day, but we could possibly have a conference day the day before. Uh, but instead of making a full conference, they make it a half day so that uh, conferences could still occur maybe in the afternoon. Um, we would still meet the required hours for our elementary school students, uh, but meet the minimum hours for our middle school and high school students too. Uh, I would have to see that in writing so I could go ahead and plug it into the calendar. I'm not going to go ahead and commit myself to something that, that uh, I'm a visual person and I'd like to see it and be able to count out the days and see, make sure that we haven't, haven't uh, missed something. Okay, thank you. Next is Dr. Hager. Yes, um, thank you. Actually, uh, Chris, or Mr. Thomas uh, mentioned my first question, which was about closing on November 23rd as well. Um, given that elementary schools are closed, if we close that day, would it, it, to me, that does make sense that that would then reduce the number of days for middle and high school students. Um, it's just a question of if we closed it all together for teachers and students, would that kind of give us both the one less day for middle and high school students and one less day for teachers and solve all of our problems. Plus, everyone would know well ahead of time that they were off the day before Thanksgiving, which may be something that's um, well accepted um, within our community. So um, I don't know if that, if I said it differently, if that makes any sense, Mr. Dukes? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the issue is reducing the, the 181 days that are currently on the calendar by one. So uh, you could either do it at the end or you can do it um, internally. Okay. So that that to me that that feels like a good solution to me. And the other solution or the alternative solution in my mind would be that um, MSEA conference day, which is on October 21st. Given that currently we now have two other professional de- development days in October for Yom Kippur and Diwali, so having a third seems to be you know a, a bit more much if we if we can um, if, if that's one solution to the calendar issue to create an inclusive calendar. Um, potentially removing that day to me, again, resonates well with me. So just saying that out loud. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Colsey. Ms. Colsey. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, um, some of my questions were already asked, so I'm just going to to, uh, go to the next person. Okay, next, um, Mr. Offerman. Uh, I simply uh, wanted to say that uh, from my experience as a parent or grandparent, uh, elementary school teachers need a full day in order to conduct conferences. And I think this is the first term, and uh, I think it's very, very essential that, that, we, that, we, uh, that we don't cut that day. But that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yes, yeah, so I want to make sure we get to all board members. There are some who haven't spoken yet. Um, next, I have is Ms. Rowe. So, Mr. Duke, you, you were emailed uh, a calendar that Mr. Friedman, who's a, a teacher in our school system, sent that starts after Labor Day, ends by June 15th, has the five holidays. What specifically was wrong with that calendar? Because the by- The calendar was off by two days. Uh, both Christmas and New Year's holidays fall on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And contractually, we have to provide an observance day for our AFSCME and ESPBC employees. Therefore, um, 
The calendar that was presented did not take that into account and fell two days short. Two days short, thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Jose. Thank you. I, um, is there anybody before me? I could wait and go last. Some of my questions are being asked. Oh, okay. Um, I believe um, Ms. Causey had a question. Thank you. Um, at the last board meeting, I had asked uh, about it, this school system engaging in survey um, in order to understand um, and try and increase the morale and recruitment and retention of uh, teachers and staff throughout the school system. Um, and the board had voted to do a more inclusive study, but at a later date. So I'm wondering, there have been a number of emails that have come in. Has any staff accumulated uh, information that has been presented and uh, what was gleaned from that information, either about a pre or post Labor Day start or about uh, the number of professional development days throughout the year? Um, I have received uh, numerous emails. Uh, the emails that I have received um, have overwhelmingly been in favor, mostly from teachers, have overly uh, been in favor of a pre-Labor Day start. I did receive an email from a, a very industrious teacher who did a survey of her colleagues and anecdotally reported that she had polled 400 and some odd of her colleagues and that um, the majority of them were in favor of a pre-Labor Day start. Um, I did receive some emails in favor of a post. I've received emails complaining of too many PD days. So um, there's opinions. Um, uh, everyone has an opinion and, and they've been expressing them. Okay, so we don't have a comprehensive understanding um, by offering a, a objective survey for people to engage in. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, let's see. We had um, Ms. Chills, who hasn't gone yet, and then Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Duke, thank you for this presentation. This actually is has made it very clear. Um, you know, we got many emails from teachers and just from looking through it, I would say predominantly most teachers were supportive of a pre-Labor Day calendar based on various factors that came into play from preparation to getting an extra paycheck. Um, there were many things even related to student achievement that was tied into it. So I would say pre almost 90% uh, of the teachers were for a pre-Labor Day from the breakdown that I did from the emails that we received from teachers, and that's who we should be listening to, the teachers and students. Uh, for your post-Labor Day hall, um, calendar, if we were to use the five increment, incremental weather days, which we most likely would, it goes all the way up to almost July, and that includes your PD days, the five days, PD days, correct? Correct. Um, if, if in the post-Labor Day start calendar, uh, if we were not to use the five inclement weather days or emergency closure days, school could end on June 20th, Tuesday, June 20th. Um, and if uh, we were to use um, all five emergency closure days, uh, the last day of school would be Tuesday, June 27th. And we most likely will. We've already had a day and a half off for rain and um, uh, extreme wind conditions. We've not even had snow yet. So th that that is a pretty long um, calendar going all the way up to almost 4th of July, I would say. And per Maryland um, code, those eight holidays that we have to have. So I believe Christmas falls on a 25th. Is a Sunday, so you have to have that Friday full day off, correct? Same thing with New Year's, you have to have Monday off to make up for that full day off. Yes, because the, both the Christmas Eve and Christmas Day fall on a weekend, and then I, I believe it's the same for New Year's. I, okay. have, I have to look. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, um, Mr. Offerman. Would 
I know you said that you think we should have conference days, a full day for conference days, but would you be comfortable having two half days instead of a full day to allow for those conferences to occur for elementary schools? I wouldn't be opposed to that, but the problem is, at least from my perspective, is scheduling. There are some parents that are going to be able to make a morning conference virtually or in person. There are some parents that may not be able to do that. Offering the full day gives them a, 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 broader, uh, a broader time frame to, to, to work in. And again, not, not scientific. I have no poll to that event. That's just my feelings. Thank you. If, if I may add, um, in some of the calendars that were um, submitted, the half-day approach was, was um, included. However, before committing to that, um, I would need to um, check with transportation to see what kind of impact that would have on resources and bus routes. Also, to, with food and nutrition services to see what kind of impact it would have on uh, providing uh, lunches for, for students. And also, I would like, I would recommend uh, polling our, our uh, elementary school principals to determine you know, what their preferences are and, and what pros and cons they, they would see to uh, two half days uh, versus one full day. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, looks like there's a question from, follow-up question, Ms. Causey. Thank you. Regarding inclement weather days, um, what, is it possible for the board to make a request to MSDE to provide guidelines for remote learning on inclement weather days? What, what needs to be done to make that uh, an option? Ms. Causey, I really don't know what the answer to that question is. COMAR requires a minimum of three inclement weather days to be built into the calendar. Uh, we've traditionally had five or more, uh, and we've continued to, to use the five. Um, I don't know what MSDE's position uh, is relative to remote learning uh, on inclement weather days. We would have to go ahead and query. The last time I queried, I did not receive any type of definitive response. Okay. Uh, it looks like the we... The board could make the Oh, request. you still have a question. Okay. Go ahead. Is that... Dr. Williams, is that something that you... Uh, See, is possible that the board requests from MSDE guidelines for remote learning? I would caution the board to make that request. All the superintendents have been discussing that with the new state superintendent. There's no definitive answer at this point. A lot of the systems want to know about virtual learning during an inclement weather day. Um, as you've heard last year, there's mixed comments about that and having students learn virtually and so uh, I, I don't think it's it's prudent to do this at this time until we hear I hear and my colleagues hear from the state superintendent okay thank you miss Mack mr. Duke I just have a process question am I correct in, in saying that we have two decisions to make we as a board have to agree on which of the things on page 14 we believe um, should be, which we should use as an adjustment. And then, and only then, we could make, um, a, take a vote on pre or post. The order in which you make those decisions is up to you, but yes, that's basically. But we do have two decisions to make. Yes, we have to agree to which of the things on page 14 and then to the vote on pre or post. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, next is Dr. Hager. Um, yes, thank you. I also want to thank Mr. Offerman because I think he made some really good points about the um, the conference days. And so back to the, the October 21st possibility, which is on the list of, of things we could do. What are the downsides of making that a regular school day? I know it would, would not allow our teachers to attend the MSEA convention. I believe it was suggested that that, that attendance has been fairly low, but, but could you talk about kind of any downsides you see in, in making that transition? Um, you, I'm, I'm not sure I understand what you want to do to the MSEA con convention day. Um, you want to make that a regular school day? I'm sorry, I thought that was one of the options, no? No. 
No, the option that uh, that's that's displayed on the slide sorry, is. Sorry, I meant I'm. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I'm getting myself confused now too with all the options. I apologize. So closing that school day would allow the teachers to go to the MSEA conference if they still chose to go, right? Correct. It's not. We're not stopping them from going by no, closing. No, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. I'd like to move that we accept the pre-Labor Day schedule at this time. Is there a second? Point of order. Yes, Mr. Thomas? Um, do we have to vote on one of these adjustments first and then the pre or post Labor Day, or can we do pre or post Labor Day and then the discussion? So that was the clarification I was going to get from legal so that we could have an understanding because there are several calendars here. So um, that was some of the clarification that I was going to get because there's pre-Labor Day with the um, extra days, the five um, holidays in there, and then there's the pre-Labor Day um, as it was originally submitted to us. So I guess I would ask um, Mr. Offerman, because he made his motion, um, was it in reference to the one with, with the days, or was it just the original one? Uh, I, I would uh, I would withdraw my motion at at this point and ask that uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mercedes uh, comment on where we are at this point with this. Okay. What do we have to do next? Thank you. Um, and I can because um, I haven't asked a question yet, so. I can ask Mr. Bersades to weigh in. What I wanted to understand is because we have several calendars here, and um, I want to make sure that we all have a clear understanding on what we're voting. The I just wanted to confirm, or actually maybe I should be asking Mr. Duke, the pre-Labor Day school calendar, the first one is the original one that you submitted. The second one is the um, one that has PDL, PLD behind it is the one that has like Eid al Fitr, Juneteenth, and the other holidays. That's correct? That's correct. So I wanted to, so now it's for um, Mr. Bersades. Um, I can't see him, but I'm sure he can hear me. <laughs> um, because there was so much confusion last time and, and, and different things, I want to be clear the direction that we as a board should take in voting to approve these. Um, uh, is it that we want to vote first on the pre-Labor Day calendar as submitted? Do we need to vote actually on all of these? Or can we vote on, um, I know we did vote last time to approve the calendar with the holidays in it. So is that the one that we should be voting on? If you could help us with some clarity, please. So I, I just want to confirm that that's accurate, that the board approved a calendar with the five holidays at its prior meeting. Yes. So that so that's a given. In order, I thought we approved mm -hmm. asking for a presentation on a calendar with those five holidays. I don't think we approved any specific calendar. Did we approve the um, one that's here with the five additional days? Was it a presentation or I or um, uh, my my understanding was it was a, a presentation on it. Yeah. Oh, a presentation on it. Right. Okay. So okay. It, it's it's still up in the air. Uh, oh. What I, what I and thank you for that. Uh, or pending, should I say. <laughs> um, it would seem to me to make most sense to make a decision on whether to go pre or post first, have a motion on that, uh, and once you've decided on whether to go pre or post, to decide whether to include the uh, calendar that includes the, the professional days with the five holidays. Okay, thank you for that, um, so that we are clear on that. Um, does any, any board members have any questions about that? Of, of, uh, sorry. <laughs> Do any board members have any questions about that so that we can make sure that we're clear? Okay, did you have a question about that, what Mr. Bruce Sadie yes. said? Because I want to be, be crystal clear as much as we can. Thank you. Uh, so before we can vote on the pre or post Labor Day calendar, uh, we have to, I would say that I thought that we would have to determine which of the five uh, suggestions we would go forward with because the pre and post Labor Day proposed calendars that include the five holidays don't align with our, the, the, the teacher days. And so I don't know how we could approve one of those without approving a calendar that 
is in, you know, uh, do you get what I'm saying? Don't we just I, correct it? I, I, I think I follow you. Yes, okay. if you could there, respond. There's no hard and fast rule that says you have to go pre and post Labor Day decision first or professional days okay. first. Okay, then um, I move that schools close for students and staff on MSCE <laughs> conference day. I have a question. Oh. Anne's been up. Conference day, October 21st, 2020. Yes, I'm sorry, Ms. Um, Mr. Um, Thomas was making his motion. I'm sorry, I didn't hear your motion. Were you still oh, making a motion? Um, I didn't hear what yeah, it was. Sorry. I move that schools close for students and staff on MS, MSEA conference day, October 21st, 2022. Second row. Okay. Um, and that was just sent to um, Ms. Scott, but I need to also okay. put it in the chat. Yeah, can you please email that over to me and, um, okay. Okay, so I'll restate that. Yes, it's being put in the chat as well. Mr. Thomas made a motion to move that schools close for students and staff on MSEA conference day, and that was seconded, I believe, by Ms. Rowe, correctly. Okay, thank you. 10-21-22. Um, I, okay. I don't see it in the chat. Okay, do all board members see it in the chat? Yeah, for some reason, it's, it's, it's not white. You can't actually read it. I mean, I can read it, but I could see you having a hard time seeing it. I just re resent it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Okay, I'll read it again. Do all board, well, first of all, do all board members see it in the chat? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'll read it again. I move that schools close for students and staff on MSEA conference day. 10-21-22, and it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. And now, we're discussing the motion. So any questions that anyone has should be on the motion. Ms. Calls, you have a question on the motion. Yes, I would like a clarification from Mr. Dukes. Uh, isn't it currently a professional development day, and if uh, teachers decide to go to MSEA, then they go to that as their professional development and other teachers, if they don't go to that, then they um, have some other professional development to do. Uh, normally there's uh, the MSEA conference, which uh, they can attend and paraeducators as well um, are open to attending the conference, which is usually in Ocean City. And those that do not attend that conference also have an option to um, participate in other types of professional development that may be available on that day uh, or report to school uh, and um, follow whatever is planned either uh, on site as professional development or system wide uh, and administered on site as professional development. So can uh, what is the impact of closing that day? And I, if I can ask Mr. Thomas, um, to speak more to why he did that, because I don't believe you spoke to your motion. Oh, I would, I would like to thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, so the reason I, I closed for that day is similar to Dr. Hager, which he said earlier, saying that um, there are two other PD days right near the that date, which are on uh, September 26th and October 5th, and those are two PD days that will be for uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Um, it will not inhibit those teachers who want to participate in the conference in Ocean City from doing so because there will be, will be off of school and so there will be the ability to travel to Ocean City to participate in those. Um, and lastly, it is to get rid of that extra teacher day that we have on the calendar so far right now um, and allow for us to meet the contracted maximum number of teacher days uh, while still including all of the five other uh, professional development days as holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it looks like Ms. Mack, you have a question on the motion? Yes. Uh, Mr. Duke, tonight TABCO President Cindy Sexton asked that we not take the MSEA conference day away. 
Does Mr. Thomas's motion as stated do that? You know, it still allows teachers that want to participate to participate in the conference. Is there any impact on teacher pay? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions on the motion? Made by Mr. Thomas? Okay. Okay, hearing none, the motion has been moved and seconded. Ms. Gilbert, may we have a roll call vote on the motion, and I will read it again. Um, the motion was made by Mr. Thomas to move that schools close for students and staff on MSEA conference day 10 21 22, and it was seconded by Ms. Rowe. Ms. Gilbert, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Ms. Han, I'm sorry, yes. may I ask a question before we vote? This is Ms. Han. I'm sorry, could board members please put their names in the chat so you can be properly recognized so that I'm, we're not interrupted um, as we move forward to go for a vote because it's getting rather confusing. Please go ahead with your question. I'm sorry, I just wanted to confirm that there's no impact in supporting this motion on professional development for teachers that choose not to participate in the MSEA conference that they will have other opportunities if they choose not to. I think we answered this, but I just, I just want to make sure that there are no unintended consequences that we're missing. Um, obviously, when the, if, if, if the motion passes and, and, and schools are closed on, on, um, on the uh, 21st, um, those teachers that want to attend the conference are free to do so, as well as paras uh, and ESPBC staff. Um, those uh, who do not attend the conference and, and want to take advantage of that day off to attend other types of professional development can do so. And obviously those that choose not to do any of those things are also free to, to not participate in any type of professional development. But they won't be provided with opportunities specifically um, by the system because we're closed. Is That's that correct. correct. It's it's basically not a duty day for teachers. Okay. Yes, to your motion, still. Uh, to Miss Hens' question. To Miss Hens' question, certainly. Thank you. Uh, so. If we are, since we will be closing on MSEA conference day, which is October 21st, uh, with this motion, if we adopt the five uh, professional development days, Diwali, which is on Monday, October 24th, which is the Monday that would follow that MSEA conference day, uh, would be recognized as a professional development day. And so it would open the opportunity for that professional development day to just be switched to the Monday after that weekend instead of the Friday before that weekend. Uh, so there could still be opportunities provided for professional development uh, that would maybe would occur simultaneously to the MSEA conference in Ocean City. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Scott, may I um, respond? Yes, please go ahead. So uh, in that example, and thank you, Mr. Thomas, um, someone who does celebrate um, Diwali who would not want to um, sacrifice that day for professional development, but instead chooses to celebrate, um, and who would not choose to, to go to the conference, would they be at a net loss for professional development days? What, what I'm getting at is, are we neglecting any population, um, unintentionally, of course, with the overall professional development opportunities that we're providing by supporting this. And it, it makes sense. I'm just trying to think of any consequences that we haven't thought of um, by not blocking this out for professional development specifically. Madam Chair, may I just respond? The original question was on that day of the 21st. If schools are closed, there will be no PD for staff on that day. Keep in mind, you've added additional days where there's PD. So I just want to go back to Ms. Hen's original question. On that particular day, staff, schools will be closed. There will be no required PD from BCPS. Yet the MSEA conference is still an option for staff. Thank you, 
Dr. Williams, what, what I'm trying to get at here is ensuring that we're maximizing PD opportunities for our staff rather than taking away opportunities is really what it comes down to. Now, keep, um, and keep that we're mind, not, yes, keep in mind school principals provide faculty meetings where there's time to look at PD, but I'm just getting back to your original question. And Mr. Thomas gave an alternative about what could potentially happen. But we would be saying there would be no BCPS PD on that day. Schools would be closed. So we would not, we would not, principals and central office team would not be generating PD for staff on a closed day. Schools being closed. So, so, so we're, I'm trying to answer your question with what will be happening on that Friday. But understanding with the additional days coming forward, there will be still more opportunities for PD. And keep in mind, our school leaders do provide PD uh, during the school year when they have their faculty meetings or grade level team meetings, et cetera. So, so. Thank I, you. And I, I understand the, the impact on this particular day. Again, I believe our, teacher, our teachers need more PD, not less. So, um, again, I'm trying to avoid the unintended okay. consequences. All right, that's time. Action. It Thank looks you. like there's an additional question from Ms. Causey. Thank you. In reviewing the presentation on, on page um, 11 and also referencing uh, page 9, so on page nine, all of those days are professional development days for teachers, but closed for students. No. I'm sorry, but there's a motion on the floor. I we have to we have to I'm process trying, that. I'm that's trying, that's separate so from what I you're haven't. asking. If you, if there's a question, it should be related to the motion. Madam Chair, it is related because I'm not sure if I'm going to vote for this until I understand what all of this presentation means. Okay, so, so what we're doing now is we're, or actually Mr. Mercedes, could you weigh in? The motion that's on the floor is what we're processing now. The presentation, um, as I understand it, can, will continue after this motion is processed and we can ask questions in regards to the calendar. Is that a correct understanding? Uh, Yes, but I understand Ms. Causey to be asking a question that, that pertains to the motion. So okay. That, so so as long can... as the question is a clarifying question pertaining to the motion, it's appropriate to ask. Yes, that's what I was doing. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Okay. So on Continue. page nine, all of those closures are professional development days for teachers and schools closed for students. No. Can you Ju clarify? Juneteenth is the closure for schools. Teachers and, and students are off. All of the other professional development days are non-school days for students, duty days for teachers. Okay, so that page nine is not that clear. Um, and then on page 11, the uh, professional development days, you're saying the previous scheduled professional development days are three and the additional board requested closures are five but they're not actually closures four of them are professional development days is that correct correct that was an oversight um juneteenth should have been designated as a school closure day not as a pd day okay thank you i wanted to understand that so all of these professional development days will have perhaps some significant number of, te of teachers and educators not available for that professional development. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Are, are there any professional development days that are not tied to a um, religious or cultural observance? The only one was the MSEA conference day. All others are tied to, uh, which was the board's um, decision, are tied to um, observing a cultural or a religious holiday. 
Okay, thank you for that clarification. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. In response to uh, Ms. Causey's question, I would say that not all educators are going to be observing each of these professional development days. So for example, if someone is celebrating the two Jewish holidays, they would also be able to participate in PD on Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al-Fitr because, you know, they wouldn't follow that religion as well. Or, I mean, that's the instance for, I guess, a few of our educators. Some educators might recognize more than just one. Um, and also, uh, Mr. Duke, you mentioned you said that there would be four PD days and June is a school closure. But because Eid al Adha falls after the conclusion of the school year, that would not be considered a PD day. Correct? Correct. So then there would be three PD days and the closure for Juneteenth. That's correct. Thank you. So I, I just wanted to get clarity on that because I initially had said five, but Oh, thank you. The board had identified Eid al Adha. And it's on, listed on the slide, and it's also footnoted that it falls after the conclusion of the school year because we were, and as well as the board, was concerned that um, with the five playing out the calendar, whether or not it would engulf Eid al Adha or not. But, Mr. Duke, just to bring a little bit clear, some clarity, what you have on slide nine and the days that are listed, it depends on whether it's pre or post, whether it, those, those, those days would be impacted as well. All, all of the days on slide nine would be included within the calendar except for Eid al-Adha, which falls outside of the, of the projected calendar at this point. Yeah, thank you. Okay, are we ready to take a vote? Are there still more questions? Okay, are there still no questions? Because I don't want to take a vote if there are still questions. Okay, Ms. Rowe, Ms. Um, Gover, could you take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Causey? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, so um, that is the motion um, that would make it as amended. Um, but before you, there was um, some board members who had questions. Ms. Pastor? My question goes back prior to Mr. Um, Thomas's motion, and it addressed uh, Mr. Persades about the vote. Uh, it does make a difference uh, it between, well, for me, it makes a difference between pre and post if we're looking at the first calendars, two calendars, and the second with all of the new holidays on it, because that changes beginning, well, changes end dates, it changes professional development. So I'd like to have us make a decision about whether we're doing pre one and two and post one and two before we move on to taking a vote about whether we are for pre or post. Does Thank you, Ms. Does that make sense to anyone? Yes, did anybody have any comment to that or? Okay. All right, thank you. Um, I think, Mr. Offerman, did you have a question still? No? Okay. Yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Um, I move to recognize Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al Fitr as professional development days, and Juneteenth as a school closure, as well as denoting Eid al Adha on the calendar. Second. And if you could send that over and Place it in the chat once again, please. 
Yes. Send. You emailed that to me? I don't see it. Oh, sorry. It was sent in the chat. In the chat. Okay. Thank you. I'll go to the chat. Okay. So, Mr. Thomas uh, moved to recognize Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al fitr as PD Days and Juneteenth as a school closure for students and staff and to denote Eid al adha on the calendar. And it was seconded by Ms. Rell. Okay, and um, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes, please. Uh, as we presented at the last board meeting, I feel that these three PD days are necessary for our student population uh, to, to have days off in recognition of those events and not have to make up any, any missing work. Um, Juneteenth, I think it is now a federal holiday and we should recognize it as a federal holiday and recognize it as a school closure. Um, and then I believe that we should be denoting Eid al Hadha on the calendar, um, just as we would denote other holidays like Indigenous, America, Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so those are my reasons for this motion, and I hope that we can opt for this more inclusive calendar and then debate the pre and post Labor Day start to the year. Thank you. Madam Thank Chair, you, Mr. Tom. Sorry, oh. I was going to ask, can I speak to the second? Yes, <laughs> you may. Um, so I think it's important to realize that we're not going to add equity for holidays and cultural awareness with in a way that's going to be always equitable for every teacher getting the exact same number of professional development hour opportunities. However, in doing the holidays this way, more teachers are getting more professional development opportunities than they are without the holidays. And I think that it is well past time that we offer accommodations for these holidays. It, we have a lot, very diverse student community, and even though we can't necessarily offer every holiday of every single religion, there are certain holidays that are more practiced by our student body than others and more recognized by our students um, in their relationships with their friends and their communities as being important. And these are the ones that people have specifically asked for. So uh, I think that just, we just need to do this. It's just the right thing. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I actually have a clarifying question. I was trying to see, is Juneteenth a school closure or... Um you said it was a professional development day, is that correct? Uh, no, in my motion, I said that recognize Juneteenth as a school closure for students and staff. And it's system-wide? system, system -wide? Oh, for students, yes, in central office and in schools. System-wide, yes. System-wide, okay. I just wanted to confirm that. Okay, it looks like there's a question from Ms. Causey. Thank you. First, I wanted to um, appreciate Mr. Thomas for... Um, making his motion and comments. And I also wanted to appreciate Ms. Rowe for making the second and for her comments. Um, I did wanna make a, a clarifying question uh, to Dr. Williams uh, related to that day. We did hear some uh, from some teachers um, that there was professional development that was um, kind of critical in terms of being small groups or a certain um, type of employee um, on the uh, Rosh Hashanah. And so there's concern that the professional development, if uh, staff uh, do go and observe a holiday or cultural um, awareness, that they have an opportunity to make up the professional development, that it will not be um, something mission critical that they will miss. So I just wanted a clarification from Dr. Williams and staff on that. I know that question came up before, and I believe the answer was yes, there are some alternatives. And Mr. Duke, would you just confirm that, please? Uh, in the past, that's the guidance that we've 
presented to the schools on, on, on those days. Thank you, Mr. Duke. Thank you. Looks like there's a comment from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I want to take a quick moment uh, for this motion. As someone who grew up celebrating Diwali, celebrating Eid, all Eids, celebrating Christmas, and getting time off for these holidays, celebrating Rosh Hashanah, this is an important uh, step towards becoming more equitable and diverse. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I grew up celebrating Diwali, so this is actually pretty close to my heart. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have an additional question from Ms. Mack. Yes, thank you. I'd like to just ask a clarifying question to Mr. Thomas, if I may. Yes, please. Does your motion essentially match the second pre second calendar? Is it does it differ at all from the second pre Labor Day calendar? Uh, it does uh, with the. Recognizing Diwali Lunar New Year, Eid al-Fatir's PD days, Juneteenth as a school closure for system-wide, and denoting Eid al-Adha on the calendar, it would not change the pre, the the second calendar for pre-Labor Day or the second al calendar for post-Labor Day that was presented by Mr. Duke, except that it would include our closure for the MSCA Conference Day. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Looks like there's a comment from Mrs. Pastora. Ms. Pastora? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just might as well put this out right now um, based on my comments from the last meeting. I will always remain steadfast about um, my concern about students and teachers being able to get the most, and I'm saying teachers, not just Paris, teachers in Paris who have to work more than one job. But I do think that with the additions of these holidays, there are just some things that are critically important to the kind of people we are and our ability to live in a more equitable and civil world of which we need a whole lot more these days. Um, and I also know being a schoolhouse person, what happens the longer we're in school in June? What happens not only to the children, but to the teachers? And so the argument that I made, so I know I'm breaking hearts out there, but the argument that I made, which I thought, which I know is valid, now plays with those holidays in, be, in place because now it means that teachers and children are going to have longer, if it were post, in school trying to get to those same second jobs, summer jobs about which I spoke before. So in light and maintaining my integrity on the issue, I do have to say that um, my thinking is tweaked if I'm to have that integrity about what I said at the last meeting. I hope I'm clear because I've not given up on my issue about teachers and students. And I won't until those who want 12 month pay for those who are getting 10 month can realize that. But these cultural recognition and are important I'm done. That's time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a clarifying question, um, and I think Ms. Mack, I think, asked it, but I just want to clarify it. Um, with the motion that um, that Mr. Thomas made to add, um, to move to add, like, the Lunar New Year, Eid al it's PD days, and Juneteenth as a school closure for students and staff, and denote Eid al adha on the calendar. Is that the um, same as the um, pre-Labor Day school calendar with PLDs, or does it differ from that? No, all of the, the two calendars with the PLDs are basically the same. As Mr. Um, Thomas's motion? The only difference is that 
according to Mr. Thomas's motion, uh, the MSEA day, um, October 21st, would be a school closure day. Staff and students would be off. Mm -hmm. The school system would be open. However, schools would be closed for students and staff. And um, the Juneteenth would be a system-wide closure day. It's already in the calendar as a school closure day, but not as a system-wide closure day. Okay, so Mr. Um, Thomas's motion is basically the same calendar that's the pre-Labor Day or post-Labor Day, either pre- or post-Labor Day calendar um, with, the with the PLDs. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what I was... <laughs> no, I was able to hear what you were asking and then um, follow up on it. Okay, so then now um, my question is, is cause to process his motion then, if we process this and approve that, then, then we could do pre or post without the PLD because it's basically saying the same thing. I guess that's what I'm trying to understand. That is correct. Okay. Because if we were to process this motion and it passes, and then we process the PLD calendar, it would be redundant, or it would... The, the, the PLD calendars, pre or post, are identical. Pre or post, I mean, yes. It would be the same thing, though. It would be redundant. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Interesting. All right, thank you for that. Okay. Um, were there any other questions, any more clarifying questions? Miss Miss Scott. Oh, Mr. Coon. Yes, please. Ah, thanks. I just I, I just wanted to to make a comment. Um, I you know I, I fully support adding these days. Um, I I just want everyone to be cognizant that <clears throat> the amount of time we're spending in school or in the school year seems to be expanding a bit, and. And I'm making this comment because Ms. Um, <clears throat> Pasteur brought it up that I see you, Christian, thank you. Um, <laughs> that people try to work during the summer and teachers are trying to be employed and uh, you know generate income on that on in that period between you know when we end school and when we start school. <clears throat> so two points I want to make. One, you know, as we you know slightly expand, even if it's just a few days, that's money, right? Because you get paid for your time. Uh, I just want to be cognizant of that. And then if we were to um, flip flop or go post and then pre a following year, then we're actually squeezing a week out of uh, teachers' salaries for that specific summer. I just, I want to point that out so that, you know, if we get consistent, we need to stay consistent. Um, and and uh, you know that will have an impact on folks. But thank you for this, and hopefully we can move forward. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Um, looks like there's a question from Miss Calzi. Mr. Mercedes. Miss Calzi asked if she has time. Oh, I'm sorry. Miss Hen has a question. Thank you. Please go ahead, Miss Hen. Thank you, Miss Scott. Um, just a quick comment. I too fully support adding these days. I, I just wanted to comment that. I think it's important that we don't lose sense of the why we're adding these days. I think that's as important, if not more important, than the calendar itself. And our decisions that we make, the most important decision we can make is to educate our community, our children and their families about the why. And I, I'm, I considered making a motion to this, but I don't think we need to, but I would encourage Dr. Williams that everywhere we publish this calendar, once we finalize it, that we link to resources to educate our stakeholders and our community to the why, to educate them about the significance of these days and the differences and, and our cultural differences so that we can make the changes that we're trying to create so that these aren't just days on a calendar, that they have meaning. And it, it, it may start with us, but it doesn't end with us. So I would just encourage us to go that one step farther that this is not just about days on a calendar and days off, but that we go farther. And and Dr. Williams, I would just ask that you take this and and run with it. You're the educators and you know what to do with it beyond that. Um, but let's not lose sight of the why. So thank you. 
Yes, it looks like there was a question. Um, Ms. Causey asked Mr. Mercedes how much time she had. Does she have any time? 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Please go ahead, Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just really wanted to appreciate Ms. Hen uh, for those comments. Uh, I won't repeat them because I don't have time. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but I did just want to say to Mr. Kuhn's um, very valid point and to uh, Ms. Pasteur's point, um, it is going to be important to evaluate the schedule and not let a creep happen in one direction or another uh, to then diminish the, the summertime not only for students and, and, and um, educators, uh, people in the school system that have those second jobs, but also just for families in terms of planning how they're going to break up um, their summer with their, with their families, because not everybody can take off work easily. Uh, so <clears throat> it, 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 we should try and be consistent and not let it creep, uh, as Mr. Kuhn said. So I support that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any additional questions? It looks like, oh, yes, there's a comment from Ms. Joes. Actually, it's a question. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Mr. Duke, um, I just want verification. Mr. Thomas's motion said Eid al Adha was um, recognized, um, is, is being recognized, but wasn't that a PD day on your pre and post Labor Day calendar? Eid al Adha falls outside of the school, the so school year as, as projected. The motion, I believe, was to an, uh, that it would be annotated on the calendar. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. All right. I want to make sure. Are there any other questions? Okay. So I'd like to know, do I have a motion to approve? Oh, I apologize. Sorry. There was already a motion. I was going to restate <laughs> So we need to process the motion that's on the floor. So now are we ready for a roll call vote? Sorry about that. Okay. Let me restate the motion. I apologize for that. Yeah, can you repost it? Because I think it went down in my chat. Okay, thank you. So it was moved by Mr. Christian Thomas to recognize, and seconded by Ms. Lily Rowe, to recognize Diwali Lunar New Year and Eid al Fitr as professional develop de development days and Juneteenth as a school closure for students and staff, and to denote Eid al Adha on the calendar. Are you ready for a roll call vote? Okay. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So that amendment passes as well. All right, so then I was going to ask if um, I have a motion to approve the pre-Labor Day school calendar recognizing Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al-Fitr as professional development days and Juneteenth as a system-wide closure for students and staff and to denote Eid al-Adha on the calendar and system-wide closure day for MSEA 10-21-22. So move, Thomas. Is there a second? Second Offerman. It was moved by Mr. Thomas and seconded by Mr. Offerman. And I am going to put that in the chat so everyone can see. So that's the original motion for the calendar with the two amendments made by Mr. Thomas. So this is the final as it would read. So um, are there any questions on, on that? Yes, Ms. Rowe, excuse me. So I just want to... Um I don't, I just want to make a comment that I don't personally love starting before Labor Day, but if I had to choose between recognizing various religions and starting after Labor Day and then being in school almost to July, 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, to me, starting after Labor Day isn't worth failing to recognize these various religions and cultural days. So while I don't love it, I, I will vote for this since we got the holidays. Thank you. Next is Ms. Causey. Thank you. I just wanted to make a comment along the lines of um, other board members that um, in the past I have supported post-Labor Day starts uh, for many reasons, uh, one of them being the significance of the agricultural industry on the state of Maryland and also on our students um, in terms of having career paths and just awareness of um, the nature and the world around them. Uh, like Ms. Rowe, there are, this is a very complicated system and it's a very complicated calendar. And unfortunately, there are, um, there are some factors that are just going to make a post-Labor Day start um, at this point run too late. We do have the advanced placement courses uh, that are set at a certain time nationwide. And so it's important for the, our students in our system to have instructional time. Uh, as well as the state assessments are, are planned at a time um, consistently by the state for the whole uh, state of Maryland. So in order for our students to be uh, equally prepared, um, it does make sense to add that instructional time at the beginning. So um, I am going to hope that the school system can work with those students and even the students not directly involved in agriculture, uh, but with families, um, and to work with a way for uh, the state fair and other agricultural activities um, can be worked in. So thank you for that. And I uh, really appreciate my colleagues and this discussion and I appreciate staff bringing this additional information. Um, but I am looking forward to a full survey in March. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, thank you. Ian, you said no, okay. Uh, looks like next is Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you, Ms. Scott. I just wanted to make a comment um, uh, because I, I don't see this as uh, either we go post Labor Day or we don't celebrate these five holidays. I, I think that we could do both. I know that it could make it up for a long late day, you know, school year. Uh, so I take issue with that. Um, I believe, and it sounds as if there's plenty of support for pre Labor Day. I will support post Labor Day, so I'll be voting against this. Um, uh, but that's just how I feel. Uh, and um, you know, congratulations on getting the calendar through. So let's take a vote. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Coon. I don't want to take a vote if there's more questions or comments out there. I want to make sure everybody's had an opportunity to to speak. Um, I would just say again, thank you all for the hard work that you've done on this for the robust conversation um, and everything and um, really putting together an equitable and inclusive calendar. Um, I think that um, Mrs. Pastor's comments resonated as far as um, having children in school longer and um, uh, um, and just sort of giving insight um, into that. So um, I just would like to thank everybody for all their comments and um, that really um, was very useful and helped, um, helped me and informed me in my decision as well. So thank you. So um, are we ready for the vote? <laughs> okay, Ms. Causey, excuse me, I thought Ms. Causey had a question. Uh, it's Ms. Hen, Ms. Hen has a question. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I've traditionally supported post Labor Day as well. Um, given the pandemic, I, I supported a pre-Labor Day start this year. Again, um, I'm concerned, as many have said, about the need for instructional time. Um, however, one thing that I read that is of particular concern is that more and more teens are entering the workforce um, to be able to support their families, especially as adults um, are out of work, and especially in hospitality industries whose prime times are that period, including the week um, before Labor Day, um, leading up to Labor Day. And in fact, the teen employment rate is the highest it's been since I wanna say 1953. Um, so losing that one week is concerning um, to me. So I won't be supporting this. I, I think the post 
um, Labor Day start will benefit many of our high schoolers that do work during the summer. Um, so I, I think that will make a dip more of a oh, difference for them awesome. than it will. Um, although I am torn and, and it is a, a tough decision. I think we can make this calendar work with a post Labor Day start. So that would be my preference for that reason. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hinn. Looks like there's a comment from Mr. Offman and then Dr. Hager. Yes, uh, as someone who sat in school buildings for 37 years in Baltimore County, uh, it has been my experience in various schools, and along with a lot of people I know, will tell you that the days after Memorial Day that you add have much less positive impact on student learning than the days early in the year. And I know there are a lot of issues, and I, I understand both uh, both uh, sides of this, but I, I, I'm looking at the educational impact. SAT days, AP days, state testing, these are set. They're not going to change from, based on what we open. If we value our, our, value our, our overall instructional days, a pre-labor day start gives us more instructional days before all, all these important events. Thank you. Thank you. Next, there's a comment from Dr. Hager. Just really fast. Um, ditto Mr. Offerman, first of all, <laughs> because that was very well said. Um, and then also just, you know, it's a week at the end or a week at the beginning of the summer. So shifting it to the end of the summer means that kids will be missing a week of work in June. And so I just feel like there's the, the list of reasons for, for pre-Labor Day start, specific to academics and so many other things are is long. And so I um, I really appreciate what Ms. Hen said and that is accurate that, you know, kids are needing to have jobs and, and, and that they need to support their families. But um, but yeah, I just I just wanted to point that out. And Mr. Offerman said, beautifully said every other thing I was thinking. So thanks. Thank you. Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, going back to what Ms. Hen said about the summer jobs, um, I would say that, yes, I, I understand that point. But I mean, our students are also working jobs during the school year, too. I'm working two jobs during the school year while being a board member, while being a student. And so I don't necessarily know if we can just say summer jobs is the reason for, for the labor, uh, post labor year start to the year because our students will be having jobs throughout the in, in entire school year if, if they are those who need to financially support their families. What Mr. Offerman said about AP tests, SAT days, all the standardized tests that we have as students that we are preparing for, that we're dedicating all of our time to to study for the PSAT and the SAT to get the highest score we can, we need as much time in the classroom to be prepared for those tests as possible. And I know that a good teacher could possibly make that work in you know less time and have more time to prep. But I mean, like Ms. like Dr. Hager said, it's either four days at the beginning or five days at the beginning or five days at the end. And I'd uh, I'd rather have those five days at the beginning so I can be more prepared for the year. So. Thank you all, and uh, I'm ready to take the vote. Thank you. Are we ready for the vote? Are there any more questions? Okay, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay. I didn't get to count, but I believe the motion carries for a, and I will read it back again so that we know. We just voted to approve a pre-Labor Day school calendar recognizing Diwali, Lunar New Year, and Eid al-Fitr as professional development days, and Juneteenth as a system-wide closure for students and staff, and to denote Eid al-Adhar on the calendar and system-wide closure day for MSEA 10-21-22. It was moved by um, Mr. Thomas and seconded by Mr. Offerman. Great. Okay, thank you. All right. Are we done? Thank you both. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, and I'm going to move along because we are really for schedule. Um, the next item on the agenda is the update on the efficiency review, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. 
So I'm going to invite Dr. Yarborough to the table, please. And I think because of the time, I want to truncate this presentation. Um, can we start with slide number four? Dr. Yarbrough, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening, Board Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the Board. The Division of Organizational Effectiveness is tasked with providing a balanced and studied approach to the implementation of the recommendations provided by the Public Works LLC and the Efficiency Review Report. The slide shows the three types of groups that are involved in reviewing and assessing the recommendations in each chapter. Division work groups, their work is to review recommendations, identify priorities, and chart a course for implementation of next steps. Blueprint review team, this team reviews and re recommendations received from division work groups to ensure alignment with Blueprint for Maryland's future. Stakeholder work group is tasked with identifying the desired end user experience. They review recommendations from division work groups and provide feedback. Next slide, please. Work groups meet regularly as depicted on this slide and published on the BCPS efficiency review page on our website. The meetings are approximately 90 minutes in length and are conducted virtually. During each meeting, work group members review a set of identified recommendations in alignment with the stated purpose. The timeline for all work groups to have completed their recommendation review will be based on the rate at which team members are able to analyze and reconcile report findings. We anticipate that the majority of work groups will be completing their review by early spring. Next slide, please. The guiding question for division work groups is, can we implement the recommendation as written? The options are yes, which prompt them to identify next steps in a timeline, yes with modifications, or no with rationale and supporting evidence. Next slide, please. Division work groups are organized by chapters as depicted in the slide. All work groups have held three meetings for a total of 21 division work group meetings to date. 48 recommendations have been reviewed and 31 have moved forward as written, while 15 have moved forward to the blueprint review team with modifications for consideration. To date, the work groups have rejected two recommendations. Next slide, please. The blueprint review team is solely focused on recommendations related to the blueprint for Maryland's future. If a recommendation is not in alignment, it is returned to the division work group with feedback and suggested revisions. If they are in alignment, they move forward to the stakeholder work group. Prior to the initial review of recommendations, this team engaged in a thorough review of the Blueprint for Maryland's Future Act to ensure a clear understanding of guidelines and to aid in their decision making. They have held two meetings and reviewed 15 recommendations. To date, all 15 recommendations have been approved and moved forward to the stakeholder work group for consideration. Next slide, please. Our stakeholder work group members are charged with evaluating the end user experience. Recommendations identified as aligned with needs move forward to be included in the comprehensive final report. Missed opportunities are returned to the division work groups for refinement or additional context as appropriate. They have met twice and reviewed five human resources recommendations. The stakeholder work group has moved three recommendations forward and identified two recommendations as having missed opportunities for the division work group to review. Next slide, please. As identified by Dr. Williams, the goal in this process is to ensure that all voices are heard and recommendations are reviewed through multiple lenses. In the interest of transparency related to implementation of recommendations, we have created a webpage 
that members of the public can use to access artifacts related to system review and implementation. The web page contains links to agendas and action items for all chapter division work groups, the blueprint review team, and the multi-stakeholder work group. Additionally, superintendent efficiency review updates and related communication will be archived on this page. It is dynamic and will change as materials and artifacts become available. At this time, I turn it back over to you, Dr. Williams. Sure. Next slide, please. So last month, we received the database of uh, 451 payroll certification and benefit-related concerns from TAPCO that we shared with staff for review. Two items related to technology and two items related to general human resources have been resolved. Our team have had an opportunity to review all of the remaining 447 entries and identify next steps with the goals of researching, resolving all concerns from members of Team BCPS. So in the area of payroll, 167 items were received. To date, 31 have been resolved completely with additional seven in the process. Payroll is working collaboratively with human resources to resolve 25 concerns and will continue moving through the list as expeditiously as possible. In terms of certification, there were 247 certification issues were moved forward. The list included 62 issues that were prioritized for immediate action. They have all been researched and those teachers contacted with the resolution and or next steps. The certification team will continue to work directly with teachers requiring follow up on the documentation issues. The team is on track for resolving 57 additional issues by Friday, December 3rd, 2021. And benefits, 32 benefit issues were received. To date, seven have been resolved and five more in the process with the Office of Payroll. I will be providing additional updates regarding this next month. Next slide. The efficiency, oh, we did the transportation. Would you please move forward to slide 16? Unless you all want me to repeat the transportation update. No, no, no. okay, okay. That was a little bit of humor. Um, the efficiency review recommends that BCPS addresses climate, work environment, and morale of staff. We know that climate and morale issues erode our effectiveness and directly impact students. If we don't take care of our team, then our, st our students don't receive our very best. With that in mind, we are crafting a multifaceted, comprehensive plan focused on engagement, wellness, and appreciation. In addition to receiving feedback and input from focus groups and school visits, union leaders have been collaborating with leadership to problem solve and share ideas from their respective memberships. Next slide. So it seems appropriate two days before Thanksgiving to express my appreciation for so many members of Team BCPS who have gone above and beyond in challenging times. Please know that we see your dedication and are appreciative of all that you do. In recognition of these tireless efforts, we are pleased to be able to provide all staff with a day off tomorrow in preparation for Thanksgiving holiday. It is my hope that, these additional, that this additional day will provide everyone with time for some well-deserved rest and an opportunity to tend to personal well-being. A part of the ongoing staff appreciation efforts, Central Office volunteers are sharing the gift of time with schools beginning Monday, November 22nd, 2021, and continuing on subsequent Mondays and Fridays throughout this current school year. Volunteers will help in a variety of ways, including bus and lunch duty, class, front, class and front office coverage, and assistance to school leaders. I wanna offer a special thank you to Deer Park Middle, Deer Park Magnet Middle School for welcoming me during hall and dismissal duty yesterday. I look forward to being on my next post next Monday afternoon at a different school. In collaboration with our union partners, we are committed to finding additional ways throughout the year to focus on staff and student physical and mental well-being and providing opportunities for our staff to rest and recharge. With the support of our board, we would like to request to close schools and offices three hours early on the following days. Thursday, December 23rd, 2021. Friday, March 18th, 2022. 
and Friday, May 20th, 2022. Our goal in sharing these three dates now is to allow families and staff to plan. We're also working together with the county government to explore retention bonus options for all of Team BCPS. We truly want to thank our staff for all that you do on behalf of BCPS students and wish you a safe and happy Thanksgiving. Last slide. We will continue to update the board, our community and team BCPS during these challenging times. Thank you so much for your continued support and engagement in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see. Um, were there any questions? It looks like there's a comment from Ms. Pastor. Uh, Dr. Yarbrough, I want to thank you for that presentation. Um, this is what one instruction is about. This is what will help us close the gap. And I'm, I appreciate that all of the connections are made with Blueprint. I can see the connection with CNI. Um, for all of the folks, all of the conversation about what goes on at professional development, what you're outlining, what all of you are outlining will undergird what professional development really looks like. It's not just about how we do materials, but what we do uh, with them and how we benefit the children. Thank you. It's great to hear that it'll be on the website, artifacts and materials, great. Dr. Williams, thanks for your piece, including those things that will change the paradigm by changing and showing folks uh, a shift in where we're going with morale. Those are the things that will help us to really close the gap and will make a difference. So I'm glad to hear it. Keep us updated on these things so as a board we can continue to chime in. And I know the more you do it, the more board members are going to start coming to those sessions that you're having. So thank you. Bravo for that. Thank you. Did you have a question? Uh, I thought I saw a hand over mm -hmm. here. No? Okay. Looks like there's a question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I just had uh, some brief questions for Dr. Williams. Um, to be clear, uh, tomorrow is a full day off, correct? Yes. 24th? Yes. Okay. All right. Because I'm at, and my follow on question is how, it, how does that impact the calendar overall? giving a full day off tomorrow is it push out push us out a day in the summer uh, miss charlie green would you come and respond i'm the bearer of good news mr king <laughs> oh okay i see how it is that's a good move i'll, I'll have to remember that one. you can't do what when i miss green speaks <laughs> it will be bad news so as Mr. Duke had an opportunity to explain a little bit earlier, the addition of the additional 15 minutes has provided us with a cushion. So when we look at tomorrow as a day off for everyone to prepare for Thanksgiving, it does not impact our inclement weather days. We remain with four inclement weather days that we can still use. And so tomorrow does not impact the end date of the school year. Now, obviously, Mother Nature, uh, we, we could have more inclement weather days than the four that we have remaining. But right now, it makes absolutely no change to the end date for the school year, nor does it impact the remaining four days uh, for inclement weather days. All right, just to clarify, we, we schedule five inclement weather days, correct? That is correct, yes. All right, so we're just displacing one of those and hoping that get a break so we did uh, use one in October and pardon me I can't remember the exact date but it was uh, oh, four left okay so we have Thank four you. remaining that's correct great um, and then my last question um, uh, dr. Williams regarding the half days um, in December March and May those still count as full school days or are they with the hours and days it doesn't mess anything up uh, with what we need to do to achieve um, the intent of, of meeting our obligations, both to the students and the hours in the state. That is correct. We had staff to check and double check. Fantastic. Thank you very much. 
Yes, next, thank you, is Ms. Rowe. So do any of um, those additional days impact the end date of this school year? The half days? No. Okay, no. so, okay, because what I heard from some teachers is that they like these breaks, but not if they end up going longer at the end. So. Um, but I must say I've heard from teachers and students and we've heard from our public comments. This is a year like no other. I understand. So we, 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 we're gonna have to meet each other in the middle and try to get through this, this challenging year with all that everyone's doing. Um, and again, we looked at this and, and felt this was a good recommendation to put forward to the board. Okay, but none of this impacts. So the teachers, then we're not giving them something and then saying they have to make it up later. We're not, but keep in mind we have inclement weather days that we hopefully won't be a bad winter. We just don't know. Well, that's aside from the, yeah. that's, we'd have that anyway, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. This is one of those examples of working with our unions and Mr. Duke and really vetting and determining if we can do this. So okay. this is where we are at this time. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the specificity of the information provided around payroll issues, and I appreciate the efforts of those in payroll who are working through them. I would like to know, do we have a proactive way to query our existing payroll system to identify when there is a problem, an incorrect pay problem, a lane change, certification change, or are we waiting for employees to notify us of those problems? So we do have mechanisms to, to determine if there is a problem. But again, as we're a part of the healing and recovery, sometimes we do have to listen to our staff. And so working collaboratively, we were able to get a list and each and payroll benefits, HR certification, they're working through that list and, and, and following up with individual staff. So yes, but as we are rebuilding, we wanna make sure we have the right tools so we are not in this circumstance again, in terms of if there's a problem that we can immediately know that there's a problem. Remember, all of these are different. Certification is the documentation. They're, they're a little different and somewhat um, individualized based on the staff, the years, the servers. Um, when we talk about payroll, there's so much specificity around that that it does require time and attention with that employee and a staff member to work through Thank you. Um, and I know one of the issues that people were having were making changes to their benefits if they had a baby or they got married. Have, do we have any of those issues outstanding that you know of? I'm unable to speak specifically around that, but we have the list and we're, even when we knew last year, we, we had some alternatives, um, particularly financing someone's buying a house or if they needed to have a letter to say that they work we work through those issues um, but um, I don't have the particular okay. list in front of me Ms. Matt. I do want to acknowledge that every time I have referred a teacher who has contacted me to you and staff that that, that issue those issues have been resolved and I appreciate that and of course I have an issue that I'm still waiting for personally but I'm sure that somebody's working on it so thank you. Yes, and that issue was responded, to my understanding, Mr. Sarris responded to you, but we'll follow up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I saw the response. But thank you. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. I really appreciate that. The staff needed to hear that, Ms. Mack. The staff listening and watching, and we'll review this, those in HR, those in payroll have been working tirelessly to, to try to address each and every problem. So, Mr. Saris and uh, Ms. Anderson, you can take that back to the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, Dr. Williams, these four things on the slide right here, the inappreci inappreciation slide, are incredible. And I want to thank you so much for bringing these forward to us. Um, I'm excited about the closure tomorrow because I do have a college interview that I'll be able to attend now. Um, I wanted to ask about the gift of time, uh, though, the, the blue thing. Uh, so 
how can board members get involved with volunteering in our schools on those Monday activities too? Uh, how can, is there, are there any way that we can get involved too? Of course. Um, there's a process. Um, you can work with Dr. Yarbrough. Uh, right now we're focusing on middle schools. As, as I shared, I was at Deer Park Magnet Middle School. So if you have the gift of time mm -hmm. just to show up and to provide that additional support, I think staff and students would appreciate that. Awesome. So we'll Thank make sure we send out a list, Ms. Gover, to see if there's some board members who would like to volunteer. Thank you. And when, if you do start to come to high schools, uh, make sure to let me know when you're coming to Eastern because I'd love to help out then too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Colsey? Thank you. I really appreciate that uh, presentation. And um, I'll just dovetail with Ms. Mack's uh, comments about appreciating that these staff's issues of payroll benefits and corrections are being addressed and uh, appreciating staff in working through all of that. Um, <clears throat> I did want to um, also just dovetail and um, acknowledge that we did receive a number of emails from uh, teachers and parents related to tomorrow's um, holiday or extra day off that there were some logistical challenges around schedules um, that were not necessarily um, considered given the short time frame. So acknowledging that, I just wanted to um, double check that those afternoon off are, are um, you know, clear on the runway. They're clear for takeoff. There, there won't be any, um, you know, challenges for our staff or uh, students or parents on those half days. And I'm thinking about the May day with testing or graduations. Again, we looked at it. The the feedback that we received was to if we were going to do so. So to your point, we received a lot of positive emails, and then we didn't see receive. We received some questionable emails, and it was just about the communication. Hence, why we are doing it now about the upcoming half days or early release. And so, um, again, the team looked at this, um, and and looked at it multiple times. So um, in terms of what you've identified, we should be okay. Okay, thank you. Um, and then in terms of the public works and the um, timeline for the work groups, um, the is, are, are the timelines of the work groups um, going to tend to mesh with the recommendations and the timelines that were suggested by the public work works consulting company and their presentation. So keep in mind, we're taking the document and making our own and we're vetting it through the different work groups. So there are times where we will be able to meet the timeline or there may be a, a slight delay. Because as I reported back in September, the timing of this was not ideal. However, there were several commendations and good recommendations on how to make our operational part of our system more efficient. So um, again, we will be making the notes available. You have the dates of the work groups. And so folks can see this transparent process that we have in place. Great, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate that recently the job descriptions um, were uh, be made available to the board and I just wanted to clarify, are they're going to be available to the public also? And where were those going to be available? So I, as outlined to the board, we shared that those job descriptions are on the website and working with Ms. Anderson and her team as we move forward. As we update um, the website, we will be adding more job descriptions to that, to that website. Thank, thank you, and I, I do think that's very helpful. Also, I did review the um, CIO position relative to the recommendations of Public Works. That's time. So I appreciate that work that was done. Thank you. That's time. May I have a motion to approve the three staff wellness breaks and 
recognition of efforts by closing three hours early on Thursday, December 21st, 2021, Friday, March 18th, 2022, and Friday, May 20th, 2022. So, so move, Thomas. So move, Thomas. <laughs> Do I have second, a second? Second, Thomas. It's called. Thomas, okay. <laughs> Who moved it first? You just want to get it's clarification awesome. on that. I heard a couple. Ms. Mack, okay, and then I know I heard Ms. Thomas second. All right, any discussion on that? I think we've kind of already Madam had discussion. Do yes. We, do we also have to officially vote for November 24th as well? It does not look like we do, no. Okay. Yep. I, I would actually like clarification on that point since Ms. Rowe brought it up. This is Ms. Causey. I have December. Yeah, I think it's supposed to be December 23rd. Yeah. Double check. So you're wanting clarification on the November 24th date if we need to have that, um, if we need to have a motion on that That's, as well? Yeah, Is that your question? It's an alteration to the calendar. I thought we would have to vote to approve that. So we have announced it. We can go ahead and add it to the motion. And a point of clarity, I just want to make sure is this happening tomorrow? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be the 23rd. So chooses, we can add it. Do, are we what my question is, is and maybe Bersady, Mr. Bersady's or, yeah, can weigh in. Do we need to add the 24th or, because um, it's already been announced, it's already been approved, do we need to have a motion to approve that? I, I don't think you need to. It, it wouldn't hurt if you did. Okay. Does Do we want to restate it and include November 24th? We, so the other one, so what it is is as I'm getting clarification, we'd have to approve it as a full day closure, which is separate from the others. The others are like closing three hours early. Okay. Yeah, so just a point of clarity. Um, the three dates again are for three hours early dismissal, Thursday, December 23rd. Friday, March 18th of 22, and May 20th of 22. Okay. Mr. Mercedes, what's the best way out of this? Should we withdraw it and restate it, or should we just strike the 21st to the 20? I, um, well, I asked, I stated it and I asked, you know, may I have a, I did say, may I have a motion to approve? So by, by the end of its consent, it can be withdrawn. Okay, then I yes. withdraw yes. it. Yes. Unanimous yes. consent. Okay, I will restate it properly now that I have the date. I posted it in the December 23rd. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Okay, so I will restate. May I have a motion to approve the three staff wellness breaks and recognition of efforts by closing three hours early on Thursday, December 23rd, 2021, Friday, March 18th, 2022, and Friday, May 20th, 2022, and to close school on November 4th, system-wide. So moved, Excuse me, on November, oh, 24th. on November 24th, system-wide. So moved, Ms. Causey. Second, Second Thomas. Okay, so it sounds like it was moved by Ms. Causey and seconded by Mr. Thomas. Any discussion? Okay, Ms. Gover, may we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? 
Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Yarborough. Thank you. Okay. Moving along. The next item on the agenda is the report on the fiscal year 2021 comprehensive annual financial report. And for that, I call on Mr. Saris. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, I'm hopeful that we still have Ms. Uh, Sherry Amos here to give a brief uh, summary of the work that Clifton Larson Allen did uh, this year in a very unusual set of circumstances surrounding the cyber attack in which uh, a very dedicated group of our fiscal services team recovered and uh, resurrected and uh, recalculated lots of data that allowed us to put together this year's financial statements uh, under most unusual uh, circumstances and for which uh, Ms. Amos and her Clifton Larson Allen team uh, responded uh, vigorously uh, to assure themselves and the public that these statements uh, are fairly presented, which uh, her firm's opinion does so indicate. And Ms. Amos, if you would like to give us some brief comments, we'd appreciate it. Sure, thank you very much for having me tonight um, to present the results of the fiscal year 2021 uh, audit of the comprehensive annual financial report of Baltimore County Public Schools. Um, as Mr. Saris did say, we did issue an unmodified audit opinion on this financial statements, um, which in a nutshell says that um, the statements are um, not materially misstated um, in accordance to uh, auditing standards. It's basically what we call like a clean opinion or a good opinion on your financial statements. Um, our audit was delayed um, this year uh, from the start due to the cyber attack. Um, and as a result, it was delayed on the back end as well. The school system does have a September 30th uh, regulatory deadline to the Maryland State Department of Education, which unfortunately was not met this year. And we did issue um, our audit opinion on October 28th. Um, the delay, again, was a result of the cyber attack and, and working through um, requests for information, additional documentation needed for us to get the assurance that we needed to get to that unmodified audit opinion for the school system. Um, we did have several findings I wanted to briefly mention to the board as a result of our audit. Um, the first one was a material weakness in internal control over payroll expenditures. Um, and during our testing, we noted um, there was a lack of approved timesheets for hourly employees, as well as instances where pay rates didn't agree to the negotiated bargaining agreements. Um, all of this was due to the loss of the Kronos timekeeping system as a result of the cyber attack, as well as the payroll system and the need to rebuild those systems um, to provide the financial information needed for the audits. The second finding we had was again, another material weakness in internal control related to accrued vacation leave. The school system does have a liability in its financial statements for vacation time that is earned by employees, however, not used or taken as of um, fiscal year end, June 30, 2021. There's several components to that calculation that we tested that go into that liability um, and the associated findings um, related to the calculation included incomplete documentation of vacation leave usage um, for us to verify the liability um, documentation on vacation leave usage that was provided wasn't consistently approved. Um, leave earned was not um, consistently in accordance with negotiated bargaining agreements. And uh, we did have an instance of an incorrect pay rate for employee that was used in the recalculation of that liability um, for the financial statements. Again, um, the findings were associated with the cyber attack 
and management need to recreate manually the leave balances for all employees as of June 30th, 2021. My next comment was a significant deficiency in internal control related to non-payroll um, expenditures. Uh, we had um, an adjusting journal entry for approximately $195,000 to properly record expenditures that were originally in fiscal year 22 that needed to be re um, moved into fiscal year 21 um, as a result of the goods or services being rendered during fiscal year 21. Uh, my next set of comments are um, management letter comments. These are what we consider best practices for the school system. And the first uh, management letter comment is related to outstanding checks. Um, throughout the school year, or the fiscal year, excuse me, the board uh, was properly reconciling all bank accounts um, for their cash accounts and investment accounts consistently each month. However, due to the cyber attack, there was a, a loss of functionality in the financial system where they could not properly, properly clear individual checks that had been cashed at the bank um, in the financial system. So when we started our audit, there was um, a significant overstatement um, in the financial system um, related to cash and payables. During the audit, um, as we were conducting our audit procedures, management was diligently working with the software vendor to fix the glitch that was occurring um, so that way they could begin to um, properly clear all the outstanding checks. And by the time um, we got to the end of the audit, they had reconciled that down to a very immaterial amount as far as we were <laughs> concerned. Uh, we just recommend that management continue to, to work on that fix of the glitch for going forward so that way um, outstanding checks could be reconciled and cleared out timely in the financial system. Um, and my last set of comments um, relate to um, information technology. Um, I do want to take just a second to remind the board of the scope of our audit was not to do an in-depth or um, comprehensive analysis of your information technology systems. Um, that was not what we were engaged to do. Um, but as through the course of our audit, we did um, have a couple comments that we thought were best practices to bring to the board. Um, the first was related mm -hmm. to um, employee user access to um, systems, whether it be HRM or financial applications. We had noted that there's four employees that were terminated from the school system whose um, user access to Advantage HRM and the financial applications was not removed timely. Um, and we just recommend going forward that on at least an annual basis that um, management's reviewing the user access for all employees to make sure it's appropriate based on their job duties within the school system and that terminated employees are, are promptly removed from the system upon termination. Uh, the second comment, um, we didn't um, note that the last formal risk assessment related to information technology was done in 2017. We recommend that the school system update that risk assessment, especially in light of the cyber attack, to ensure that um, they are able to identify gaps in internal controls and ensure compliance with laws and regulations. Uh, the next comment was we noted that there was no IT strategic, IT strategic plan in place. Um, and we recommend that an IT strategic plan be um, thought through and implemented that aligns with the strategic planning of their overall school system operations. And then lastly, in light of the cyber attack, uh, we noted that um, the, now the business continuity plan and disaster recovery plans are out of date and don't reflect the current environment post cyber attack and the changes that have been made um, as a result of the cyber attack, the moving to the cloud and things of that nature. So we recommend management update both of those plans to ensure that they reflect the current nature and environment and policies and procedures um, going forward um, post cyber attack. Um, those um, were the items I, I wanted to bring to the board's attention tonight and we welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you. I wanted to see if there are any questions. Uh, looks like there's a question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Thanks for providing this information. Really appreciate it. Um, I understand the two material weaknesses um, that you mentioned, uh, you know, related to Kronos and um, issues with handling accrued time, probably because our record keeping is is off at this point. Hopefully, um, 
And I know staff has been working hard and we've been spending a significant amount of money on all of that. Um, so I'm expecting that to be, to be corrected. Uh, the question that I had was, um, you know, you said there's a significant finding um, and you mentioned uh, an amount of $195,000. And I would, I would just wonder if you could kind of characterize what that, what that means and what it was from. Uh, it looks like we spent money in 21 that we didn't have and we had to pull money from 22 to 21. How yeah. does that work? I don't uh, let me clarify that. So that was related to cap uh, capital projects fund in the financial statements where the expenditures were just recorded in the wrong fiscal year. It didn't have a budgetary impact at all. It was just um, the goods or services were performed in fiscal year 21. The invoice was received after June 30th and recorded in fiscal year 22 when it should have been accrued back to fiscal year 21. So there shouldn't have been any budgetary impact on that. It's more for financial reporting purposes. And just to clarify, this this wasn't one invoice, was it a one project? It was, it was just or, a couple. Yeah. It wasn't, I wouldn't say clarify a lot. It was just like maybe two or three invoices that amount to that amount. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thanks. I appreciate this. Um, sure. You know, I fully, I also really appreciate you highlighting the IT issues that you saw. Um, uh, we know firsthand. <laughs> That, you know that there are significant issues and I know that the efficiency uh, audit talked specifically at adding a CIO position and I'm hopeful that um, the superintendent moves quickly on that because that person should be spearheading an IT strategy document and managing recovery plan and all the things that you mentioned uh, to make sure that there's there's no reoccurrence of what we ran into because it was very painful and very expensive Thank you for your time. Sure. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> thank you. Any other questions? No? Hearing none? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Saris, and thank you, Ms. Almos. Oh, thank it looks you. like there is a uh, question. <laughs> Happens every time I say any questions, nothing. Then right at the very end, um, yes, Ms. Causey. Uh, thank you for that presentation. And um, when you had mentioned the different findings in the report uh, that was attached to board docs. It doesn't have the word findings and I didn't find the word deficiency. So I'm wondering if um, the presentation that you gave us, is that in the report or is that another document that will be provided with your comments? Sure. So um, there is the financial statements are a separate document with our audit opinion in it. The, um, the related comments um, that I went through are in two separate documents that were provided um, to management um, to provide to the board. I, I don't know if they got into the board docs or the status of that, but they, um, they were um, provided to the audit. They should have been, they were provided to management to provide to everybody. They were presented uh, in Ms. Amos's meeting with the audit committee last week and they uh, will be presented to the board, but they are management comments, so they're not included in uh, board docs. If the board chooses to do so, they may. So uh, we'll have those for you. Okay, I would request Dr. Williams to attach them to board docs since we're, it's on the agenda for this meeting and the, and the board is discussing it. it was. I appreciate the comments that you, uh, that you presented to us. Um, the other issue is there was a, in an audit committee meeting, there was a question of um, reclassifying ESSER fund spending with, a, with reviewing the grants from the ESSER funds. Is that a separate um, review than the comprehensive annual financial report? Um, so the ESSER funds were not covered specifically in the comprehensive annual financial report. This is for financial statement purposes. The ESSER funds will be covered in the single audit, uh, which we are in the process of working on currently right now. Um, that That's not due until at least the end, December 31st at this point, um, with a possible extension from Maryland State Department of Education. So uh, we're still working through the programmatic side of the federal grants, including ESSER um, and CRF. Okay, so that's that's a report that, or that's a review that's currently being done, uh, right. with the current deadline of the end of December. Mm -hmm. But it Correct. may get moved. It, it may they they extended it last year. I know there's been a request for extension this year. 
um, as a lot of the boards um, of education across the state are, are behind. <laughs> and uh, we're still waiting on um, additional guidance from the federal um, regulators over those programs as well that hasn't come out. In fact, it's supposed to come out by Thanksgiving, and I guess we have a day left to see if we get that additional guidance from the feds. <laughs> Okay, yes. Uh, <laughs> so many moving parts. I appreciate it, that. There is at this point, yes. <laughs> and, I, and I do um, dovetail with Mr. Kuhn, the um, hiring, the board's approval of Dr. Uh, Williams' recommendation to move forward with some of the recommendations, and we're going in a phased approach, uh, as was mentioned earlier, includes the CIO um, in the first round of changes. So I believe also that that's going to be very helpful to have that caliber at that C-suite executive um, assisting the superintendent and, the, and staff with all of these strategic and um, operational issues. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Additional questions? Looking at the chat, going once, going twice. All right, thank you. Mr. Thank Saris. You and thank you, Ms. Amos. Um, the next item on the agenda is the report on college and career readiness, career and technical education, dual enrollment, and college credit. And for that, I call on Dr. McComas. So good evening, uh, Chair Scott, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. Um, we are pleased this evening to bring you um, an overview presentation on our college and career readiness. Um, as all of you are well aware, you know our mission is to make sure that our students are not only ready for college, but ultimately career, and that can take many paths. Our team this evening, um, we're, we have the pleasure of having Principal Jarnigan um, representing Woodlawn High School. We have Principal um, Powell representing Kenwood High School. <laughs> Dr. Woolridge uh, representing our Office of College and Career Readiness, and Dr. Grubbs representing um, our CTE team. Um, so with no further ado, I'll turn it over and Principal Powell will kick us off and get us started. Could we have the presentation up as, please? Thank you. You can go to the next slide. Fantastic, thank you. So good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I'm Brian Powell, the very proud principal of Kenwood High School. I'm here this evening to discuss the ways that BCPS offers programs and opportunities to ensure that every child has a bright future after leaving high school and can compete at the highest level as they pursue their goals. A board goal that aligns to this is ensuring all students are enrolled in courses that adequately prepare them to be career and college ready upon graduation. This evening, you will hear from Dr. Woldridge, Dr. Grubbs, Principal Jernigan, and myself about specific, excuse me, specific ways BCPS makes this happen for students. At this time, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Woldridge. Thank you, Principal Powell. Good evening. BCPS's college and career readiness programs align with our strategic plan. The compass, our pathway to excellence in learning, accountability, and results. Our goal is simple, preparing each child to graduate ready to enter their chosen career, career training, military training, or credit-bearing college-level coursework. Our work is to provide the necessary supports to deliver on that promise. Next slide, please. And the next, please. Thank you. Beginning in the 2023-2024 school year, syst school systems in Maryland will be required to provide all students who meet college and career ready standards access to three pathways to future success at no cost to our students. This evening, we will share with you how BCPS is already fulfilling many components of this future requirement. Thank you. Next slide, please. The BCPS framework for college and career readiness offers students a rich advanced placement program a comprehensive dual enrollment program, and a wealth of career and technical education programs in every high school. These programs set our students up for success on college and career ready assessments, in college level credit bearing courses, 
and in industry recognized internships, apprenticeships, work-based learning opportunities and training programs. This is the value added aspect of our educational system. Students in BCPS do not just graduate with a high school diploma, they leave with college credits, college acceptances, scholarships, apprenticeships, industry credentials, and jobs making above minimum wage salaries. Next slide, please. Let's begin with our early college access programs in partnership with the College Board. BCPS partners with the College Board to connect students to college success and opportunity through the implementation of several early college access programs. BCPS partners with the College Board to administer the College Board suite of assessments. Each high school administers the preliminary scholastic achievement test, the PSAT 8-9, to all ninth graders and the PSAT National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test the NMSQT to all 10th and 11th graders in the fall of each year. These administrations help prepare students for the scholastic achievement test, better known as the SAT, which all 11th grade students take in the spring each year. Many colleges and universities across the nation can consider and may require SAT scores as a part of their admissions process. Students can prepare for the SATs by enrolling in their high school's SAT prep course for math and or disciplinary literacy. Students can also prepare by linking their College Board accounts to Khan Academy. When they do this, they receive personalized instruction and customized practice in order to improve their scores. <clears throat> During the pandemic, we were able to provide the PSAT for almost 1,800 juniors in January of 2021, and the SAT for 3, 000, over 3,000 juniors in April of 2021. And just one month ago, we administered the PSAT, PSAT to over 20,000 juniors, sophomores, and freshmen. We thank you, our board, for providing funds to allow our students to take these important college and career ready assessments free each year. BCPS also partners with the College Board to provide advanced placement courses to students. On November 9th, the board received a full report on our advanced placement programs. As you know, our goal is for all students to be college and career ready. Our partnership with the College Board and advanced placement programming allows us to offer our students college level, potentially credit bearing uh, courses. Principal Jernigan. Please tell us about our dual enrollment in the early college program at Woodlawn High School. Thank you. Participating in AP courses is not the only way our scholars can earn college credit while still in high school. Early college access programs have grown exponentially since 2014 when Senate Bill 740 was passed, requiring tuition discounts be given to high school students taking college classes at local community and state colleges and universities. BCPS enjoys a robust partnership with the Community College of Baltimore County, which enables high school students to take college courses at a 50% tuition reduction. Qualifying students can take up to four courses tuition free. For students who cannot travel to CCBC's campuses, they can take online classes or they can take classes on location at their locally zoned high school. These college classes are taught by CCBC college instructors, over 1,000 BCPS students take college courses at CCBC each fall and spring semester. BCPS and CCBC partner to offer over 50 dual credited courses to BCPS students. These are courses that students take at CCBC for college credit and also receive high school credit. Research shows that students who participate in dual enrollment, particularly in early college high schools, are more likely to enroll in college post high school and to earn a degree in five years compared to students who do not participate in dual enrollment or early college high school experiences. Next slide, please. One more, One more slide, please. As the proud principal of Woodlawn High School, I'm so excited to share with you details of how dual enrollment benefits students within our school community. To enhance our students' opportunities to participate in dual enrollment, BCPS created the Early College Magnet at Woodlawn High School. 
Participating students are enrolled in both BCPS and CCBC starting the summer before their ninth grade year. After following the rigorous course sequence, students have the opportunity to graduate high school in four years while simultaneously earning an AA degree. This past year, we graduated our first cohort of ECP students. The displayed graphics give you a quick glance at the demographics of our program graduates to date. The benefits of our program are too plentiful for me to fully capture in the short time we've reserved tonight. However, I do believe that student voice can best describe its impact. Let's hear from one of our ECP scholars at Woodlawn High School. I'm so proud to virtually announce and, and introduce Tiberius Brooks, who's one of our dynamic seniors in the class of 2022, who is currently completing our ECP magnet. Are we able to cue the video clip? So I'm on track to graduate with my AA degree this December, and one of the advantages of being a part of the ECAP program is the additional preparedness that it gives me for when I move on to a four-year institution. Uh, my biggest goal is after I get my AA degree to transfer to Rensselaer Polytechnical Institute. It's an amazing engineering school, and I want to go there for mechanical engineering, and without the skills an organization and time management that the ECAP program was able to give me, that it's able to prepare me far better than what normal high school would do, it'd be impossible to go there without it. Thank you, thank you. I'm so proud of Tiberius, and I do want to congratulate him in completing his AA degree ahead of schedule, and in just a few weeks at the end of the semester, he will be receiving that degree. Thank you. Last year, over half of our ECP students in our first cohort graduated with their AA degree. That is 25% more than national average. CCBC has also committed to paying for the remaining students to complete their AA degrees this year. Completing high school while having earned a significant number of college credits passes on savings of thousands of dollars to our students and their families, and it jumpstarts our students' post-secondary education plans. Our continued work at the school level is to utilize an equity lens to analyze multiple data points and communication streams in recruiting diverse student groups to ensure access, opportunity, and achievement is promoted for students within our school community. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Jernigan. To support our students in all pathways to college and career readiness, BCPS supports school-based student mentoring programs. Mentoring creates a strong connection between individuals based on trust. The mentoring relationships focus on support for academic, social, and emotional issues our youth are dealing with and planning for, for their future choices. Fostering positive relationships is essential to providing students with the environment they need to be successful lifelong learners. Through mentoring, students have access to a trusted mentor who is committed to guiding mentees through their school experience and Currently, there are 106 mentoring programs in BCPS schools. They employ a wide variety of mentoring approaches, including, but not limited to, one-to-one, -to -one, group mentoring, peer mentoring, and combination programs. Our mentors are teachers, counselors, avid students, central office staff, and community members. We are grateful for all who teach and mentor our students toward college and career readiness. Next slide, please. 
Another college and career readiness support in place in 56 of our schools is the Advancement via Individual Determination, or AVID program. AVID is a college readiness system with a, mi a mission to close the opportunity gap by preparing all students for college readiness and success in a global society. This directly aligns with BCPS's vision of raising the bar, closing gaps, preparing for our future. BCPS AVID district leadership focuses on providing access and support to rigorous courses for underrepresented and underserved student populations. AVID is a K through 12 college and career readiness system that includes an AVID elective program for students in grades six through 12 who are identified as students in the academic middle with a desire to go to college and who may face barriers or be a part of an underrepresented or underserved student population. AVID is currently implemented at a school-wide system in 11 BCPS elementary schools, 24 BCPS middle schools, God bless, and all 22 BCPS comprehensive high schools. This school year, AVID is serving over 7,000 students through the AVID elective class in grades 6 through 12 and in the classrooms of AVID trained elementary school teachers. The BCPS class, AVID class of 2021 was our largest graduating class ever with 570 graduating AVID scholars who earned a combined total of more than $36 million in scholarships and grant offers. We celebrate the success of our AVID scholars. And now it is my pleasure to turn the presentation back to Principal Powell. Thank you, Dr. Wooders. Next slide, please. So what do these terrific items and successes uh, look like and produce uh, in our school? Much of our successes begin with our truly wonderful and dedicated teachers, paraeducators, staff, school counselors, and administrators as we implement as much consistency as possible with our educational program. Our main goal is to ensure our students are able to compete at the highest level as they pursue their goals and dreams. This comes from our belief that every student can find their potential pathway in our building with our individualized support. At Kenwood, we have so many terrific programs and opportunities for our students. We have our advanced placement program where we have supported students and increased our AP pass rate each year. We're able to support this through our annual advanced placement fair where students have the opportunity to explore all of our AP classes and talk with our AP teachers and current students in the AP course. We have two terrific magnet programs in our international baccalaureate program and sports science academy. Our IB program has continued to thrive. For example, last school year, we had five students earn their IB diploma where they were able to start their college years as sophomore status. We also find a terrific balance between our AP and IB programs. Our AP students can enroll in an IB course and vice versa. We do our best to provide opportunities for students to engage and participate in every course of interest to them, regardless of what specific program they may be in. Our Sports Science Academy has produced many students getting into the field and recently saw increases in students pursuing PE and health education professions. We also focus heavily on our strong feeder school connection, collaboration, and articulation with Stemmers Run Middle School and Middle River Middle School. Both Stemmers Run Middle and Middle River Middle, along with our KHS, became authorized as MYP schools under the International Baccalaureate Program, where students have the opportunity to engage in five consecutive years of IB instructional mindset with the potential to enter our IB diploma program upon graduation or moving into their junior year. We also have our KHS counselors connect with our rising ninth graders individually at the middle schools to select their classes for their future ninth grade year and their potential pathways they may be interested in. Our AVID program continues to thrive and provide student support in earning many scholarship dollars. For example, class of, our class of 2019 earned just about $3.65 million. Our class of 2020 earned just about $3 million. And our class of 2021 earned just about $3.4 million in college scholarships. We have AVID students who also participate in one of our many completer programs where they continue to explore and find what truly interests them. Prior to COVID-19, we were able to host CCBC instructors at our KHS to implement dual enrollment courses for our students and increase access. Dual enrollment numbers in, two, in the 2021 school year included 33 students taking a combined of 48 courses. Dual enrollment numbers in our 1920 school year included 66 students taking a combined of 115 courses. 
We have a variety of mentoring programs specific to students' needs where they have a go-to adult in the building to ask questions, build a strong relationship with, and connection to receive support towards their goals. Our school counselors <coughs> work diligently in providing classroom lessons and individualized planning with students on their caseloads. School counselors meet individually with each student on their grade level to discuss course selections and alignment with their college and or career goals. Our school counselors effectively use Naviance and six-year planning tools for communication with students, families, colleges, et cetera. Thank you very much to our board budget approval committee for supporting the use of Naviance so all students can easily access. <coughs> and now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Grubbs, who will share more about BCPS College and Career Ready Pathways available to our students. Thank you, Mr. Powell. <clears throat> so CTE supports career, college and career readiness for preparing students for any path that they choose after high school. Um, one of the things we really like to highlight is that from managing a food truck to JRTC to participating in our CTSOs, such as Future Business Leaders of America, Educators Rising, um, even things like extracurricular activities such as robotics, we prepare students to leave high school with not only a diploma, but a resume. Next slide, please. While many might associate career and technical education with high school students and programs of study, Career exploration and exposure really begins at the elementary level. We are pleased to share that we partner with many elementary schools on career days, school counseling office with uh, resources that we share about our CT programs of study, and even partnering with the social studies office on JA BizTown. At the middle school level, we continue that exposure with uh, opportunities such as the six-year plan and our recent event that we held last week with all of our grade eight students being exposed to career exploration through JA Inspire. In previous years, we've bused almost 8,000 students to the fairgrounds to get them to connected with business partners and early exposure to career and technical education. That career exploration continues into the high school level with opportunities such as CT programs of study, youth apprenticeships, internships, and other opportunities such as our WIOA in-school youth grant. But it doesn't end there. We support students two quarters after uh, graduation. We monitor their employment status and we support out of school youth and we uh, continue articulation and dual credit opportunities for students into higher education pathways. Next slide, please. While career and technical education might be about industry credentials and dual and articulated credit, we still have that vocational foundation. We still support the trades, but we embrace new programs such as aviation technology and artificial intelligence. Industry credentials such as Autodesk Inventor, Certified Nursing Assistant, and Cybersecurity through Cisco are just a few of the industry credentials that we offer to all our students. We are pleased to share that in 2019, the board and academics supported certification funds so that no student would have to pay for certifications out of their pocket. Previous years, that was a major equity issue. That cost was picked up by students, principals, parents. It was really all over the place, and we are very thankful for those funds. Now no student has to pay for their certification. Career and technical education also offers alignment to high-skill, high-wage, and in-demand careers. That is a never-ending job to make sure that we are responding to business and industry changing needs. And we provide students employability skills. It's not just about career placement. One example I always like to highlight is a student from Pikesville High School. When asked by our engineering advisory council what engineering school he was going to pick, he was a PLTW engineering student, he said, I'm not going to be a lawyer. They looked at him shocked. He said, I'm going to be a lawyer. They said, well, why did you take PLTW Engineering? It was for the communication skills, the collaboration, the project management. And that is what CT is about. It's not just about tracking students in a career in high school. Uh, we also provide things like disciplinary literacy, reading authentic tests, interpreting a blueprint, coding, computer science, mathematics, applying Pythagorean theorem to build a wall in carpentry, measuring and baking pastry, and calculating in our computer science programs. Next slide, please. We are pleased to share that uh, we have increased enrollment from 11,000 in 2014 to nearly 17,500 in 2020. Uh, that number continues to rise, and that's uh, because of the support that we get in BCPS. Um, we have nearly 1,300 internships year, each year. That is pre-Labor Day start or post-Labor Day start. It doesn't matter. <laughs> I've been waiting all night to say that. <laughs> Um, and even through COVID, we held those numbers up very strong. And that's something that uh, I give my team a major kudos, Ms. Alicia Fales and Ms. Val Brennan. 
Um, one thing that we are looking to grow as well are youth apprenticeships to align the blueprint for Maryland's future. Uh, one student, Dante Taylor from Woodland High School, uh, this summer he worked for Denver Elec, a mechanical contracting company, and he was recently highlighted in Youth Apprenticeship Week. Back to our data, um, we are leading the state in enrollment and in percentage of high school students participating in CT at 51.5%. I'm very pleased with the work that we're doing in BCPS to continue to increase those numbers. Next slide, please. Um, CT programs of study are uh, very equal and equitably offered in BCPS, and I really contribute that work to Douglas Handy in 2015. He initiated a five-year plan that I was able to continue to lead, and I really closed up this past year, and that leads us into a new five-year plan that I will be discussing, uh, hopefully, in future meetings. We currently offer nearly 40 programs of study or pathways in BCPS. And our goal over the last five years was to make, that, make sure that each geographic zone had all 10 career clusters represented and each high school had at least three CT programs of study. We are pleased to share that we have accomplished that goal with the exception of one cluster, environmental and natural resources, which is not currently in our east zone, but that is work that we are gonna continue. Next slide, please. We're also very pleased to share that our career cluster very, um, very closely matches the greater Baltimore County region. Um, our cluster programs are growing around information technology, which is really indicative of the Baltimore County region. Uh, we also have a large uh, enrollment around business management and finance, consumer services, hospitality, and tourism. And we have a growing number of students participating in manufacturing, engineering, and technology, which is really around those STEM fields. Um, we are constantly reviewing our programs of study and partnering with Community College of Baltimore County, Department of Labor, and MSDE to offer new programs of study for our students. Just a few select examples are aviation technology, where students get their remote pilot's license, artificial intelligence, construction design management, which replaced our drafting program, and ProStart, which replaced our traditional family and consumer science program. Next slide, please. We are also continuing to innovate in another, uh, um, several other areas as well. Um, as Dr. Wooldridge mentioned, we have many ECAP programs in BCPS, including Pathways to Technology Early College High School that is offered at Dundalk High School, we are in year four, and Owings Mills High School, which is our recent addition. Um, as I mentioned, aviation technology and artificial intelligence, those are actually the byproduct of MSDE CT innovation grants. Uh, both were $150,000 grants that we applied for and received from the state uh, to plan and implement the program. And then the one that we've been most excited about, and I think we've had five grant openings, was the CT food trailer. And I know many board members have participated in those events. Um, and that's more than just a food trailer. It's about students learning entrepreneurship skills, customer service, and business management. Next slide, please. We're also uh, very pleased to share our technical skill attainment. Um, technical skill assessment costs, as I mentioned, are now covered by the CT office. And we are pleased to share that we are at the state average with 74.36% of CT concentrators attaining technical skill assessment. We are above the state average with 85% of CT concentrators attaining industry credentials. Those are numbers that we continue to increase and we continue to hope to improve, especially with our recent funding where it's much more equitable. Next slide, please. But it doesn't stop there. Ensuring the students are col our college and career readiness really focuses on recruitment and retention. We are pleased to share that last summer we offered our first ever and free CT summer camp. We had 160 grade eight students that participated and we exposed them to all 10 career cl clusters over the course of a week. As I mentioned, we did Junior Achievement Inspire. That's been three years in the making and it really gives all grade eight students the opportunity to learn more about CT. We have recently also uh, undergone a review of our CT flyers and we are pleased to share that we just recently revealed, unveiled them and we'll be pushing those out for the school system for uh, really consistent messaging on what our programs offer and what they, um, the courses that are behind them. Lastly, the work that I'm most proud of is the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity, or NAEP. Uh, we are in the fourth cohort and um, what we do with that work is we look at enrollment data, participation and completion, and we look for opportunities to disrupt 
uh, by gender, race, and special populations who are in our classrooms. It is an action research project that is completed by our teachers where they form a hypothesis and they look to uh, build educator capacity to disrupt some of that data. Next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Grubbs. And, and with the common theme of the great programs that Dr. Grubbs has just talked about, we are very fortunate at Kenwood High School to have many of those CTE programs in our building uh, at KHS for students to thrive in. We believe we can support students in providing each of them the opportunity to identify their interests going to their post high school plans and being successful. For example, in looking at our master schedule, our, master, our school's master schedule is truly driven by our student course requests. We look to begin our next year's scheduling process in the months of December and January, and it goes all the way through January and sometimes into February. We take our student course requests and then build our allocations and master schedule around those very student course requests. We offer a variety of electives for students to choose from, and we continue to de develop a strong identity as a school. Due to the many programs and offerings we can provide to students, we focus on the importance of communication of this information to our students and families. With all the great programs that we have, we want to make sure that all of our students and families and guardians and parents are aware of those terrific programs. So we do this, for example, such as providing families a weekly Sunday call and email highlighting items coming up in the following week or near future. We also provide our students live televideo announcements, information through their homeroom classes, grade level celebratory events, our KHS bi-weekly advisory periods, grade level assemblies, etc. We also again have our two magnet programs, AVID, nine completer pathways, which include awesome programs such as carpentry, plumbing, graphic communications, pro start, and child development. We also run our annual completer fairs, where all students have the opportunity to visit and hear from our teachers and students currently in the completer programs as they go to make their course requests for the next school year. It's so important for, those, for our students to be able to hear about those options going into this important timing, uh, time of year around their schedule request for that next school year. <coughs> Excuse me. We also have our Air Force JROTC program that is specific to KHS and newly implemented aviation program for students. This has been a wonderful addition to our school as we have continued to build our relationships with very nearby Martin State Airport and endless opportunities for our students. Students can be in our aviation program, but not necessarily in our AFJROTC and vice versa. Students are engaged in learning about all aspects of aviation, such as flying a plane, building a plane, flying drones, and much more. It's still in its early stages, but recently we've had four cadets that have pursued additional aviation coursework with the focus on becoming a pilot. Students in our program have logged over 425 hours of formal aviation instruction using our state-of-the-art flight simulator. Our AFJROTC program has presented the 40-hour FAA ground private pilot certification to over 150 countywide JROTC students and 15 BCPS faculty members. Our carpentry and plumbing programs have produced 85 OSHA 10 certifications over the past five years. Our carpentry program recently conducted an open house for companies to come visit our site and how we are producing future members in the workforce. This open house established five new partnerships where students could have the opportunity to go directly into the workforce with these partners. In our plumbing program, as well as our graphic communications program, we have had many alumni come back to speak to our current students about their successes due to the instruction in our program. We have also had eight students go directly into the field and two of which are current journeymen in their careers. Over the past four years, we have had 35 students earn their Serve Safe Food Handler Certificate, which is good for five years and that associated with our Pro Start program. In our graphic communications program, we have had 16 students hired in full-time career positions since 2019 and 100% of our class of 2021 graduated with their Print Ed Certificate. Since 2018, we have had 22 students graduate with their 90-hour certificate with our child development program, as well as many of our early childhood interns are placed at our feeder elementary schools and community daycare centers. We often have our alumni students again come back to speak to our current students so they can share their experience and highlight all the wonderful benefits that our current instructional program has provided to them and prepared them for their now careers. In our CCRD program, we support students in connecting them with many work and internship experiences to build their resumes and work experience. 
We look to individualize this and provide students workplace internships that coincide with their current interests. At KHS, we are thankful to have so many wonderful programs for our students, and we strive to provide our students the opportunity to engage in a program that best fits them to build their very bright future. We are very grateful, and in this season of Thanksgiving, thankful for, our, for, our, for the support from our BCPS content offices to implement these programs for our students. Again, much, much, much of our successes are due and that have been shared here this afternoon or this evening are due to the terrific collaboration between our students, families, and our absolutely wonderful KHS staff of teachers, paraeducators, support staff, school counselors, and administrators. It continues to be our goal to best support students there so they are able to compete again at the highest level among their peers as they pursue their college and or career goals. We truly believe we can provide every student the opportunity to go into their career pathways. Next slide, please. This visual will be made available for students and families on the BCPS website and board docs. This summarizes the multiple pathways and programs that we have discussed tonight, and each logo is linked to, to the corresponding website for easy access of students and families. Next slide, please. And we certainly thank you for the opportunity to present this information and for your ongoing support and attention this evening. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and I think there's some questions or comments from board members. Um, given the hour, I, I would like to remind board members that it is um, 11.30. But um, yes, um, Mr. Offerman was first. Uh, first of all, thank you. But more important than that, this is one of the most uplifting things th that this board has heard in, in such a long, long time. I applaud you. And if I had more time, I'd say more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Mack. I agree with Mr. Offerman. Um, and m my life has been touched by some of this. I represented a child in foster care who hated school, but she happened to be at a middle school where AVID was offered. And she was in the AVID program. And every time she and I met, she talked, she said something about AVID. And at the time, I wasn't associated with education at all and I had to look to see what it was because she really hated school <laughs> um, but she loved AVID and then pre-COVID Mr. McMillian and I were able to experience the aviation technology at Kenwood it was interesting but it wasn't easy very recently um, Miss Hen Mr. Thomas and I attended a food a food truck um, event which was wonderful and my cousin's son, who was a 2020 graduate of Lansdowne High School, in, took the engineering CTE program. He internship with the company that he is full-time employed with today. So I have seen firsthand that there is so much positive benefits for our students from these programs. So thank you for the presentation and thank you for the work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Pastor. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. I want to uh, ditto what the last two speakers have said. This is awesome. And um, what's going on, Mr. Power, at Kenwood is absolutely incredible. Seeing all of these things happen in the last few years, because I'm very familiar um, with Kenwood, I am um, just completely impressed. So having said that, and then Ms. Jernigan, the things about which you spoke at Woodlawn High School, love it, love it, love it. Okay. <laughs> now let's talk about where I'm getting ready to go because I pulled out the list of where all of these fabulous programs are. So I'm still going to reiterate Dr. McComas um, and uh whoever, uh, is now over CTE. Is that Ms. Fisher, um, uh, Mr. Handy? I heard tonight every school has one or two programs, but those programs on the west side of the county don't necessarily match uh, the interests or um, the needs of the population. I would love to see some of those. Pro I'd love to see two of those programs that about which we've heard tonight. And I'm not talking about AVID. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I'm talking about the CTE program specifically um, in 
more of the schools having that center. Dr. Williams, we've talked about it. I'm not going to let that go because they do make a difference in the success of our children. So when we talk about the disruptions in the schools, then let's process some of the things that are in the schools that are really there for all of our children, because that is what were on, was on these slides, and that is what Blueprint talks about. What is going to move Time. all of our children? I hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Scott. And thank you all up there for presenting this today. It, it, it was amazing. It was fabulous. And Ms. Fester's word and Mr. Offerman just said it. And I just want to say that I'm a product of all of this work. Me sitting up here today is because of the work and the investment that you guys have put into the ECAF, the, the early college access programs, the magnet programs, CTA programs. You know, I'm a student at Eastern Tech where I am majoring in allied health right now, but I don't want to pursue medicine at all. I want to go into government and politics, but you know, the background I'm going to have from allied health is going to be so foundational to maybe some of the legislative efforts I do regarding healthcare in the future. I have taken these dual enrollment courses at reduced cost over the summer. I've taken college level courses where people have come into my allied health classroom and taught us about the academy of health professions and so many more things. I am OSHA certified because of my program. And I just wanted to say that uh, this is so incredible. And it, like Ms. Pastor said, it, and like Ms. Max said, it can really change the direction of a student's life. Um, I don't know if I'd be sitting here right now if it wasn't for these programs and the opportunities that they created for me. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Rell. Thank you all for that presentation. I'm astounded by the sheer number of different opportunities and different types of opportunities that our, our different students have. And um, I can't imagine like just how much it must reduce the student debt to be able to finish with an associate's degree. And because I know there are some universities that will take that as two years in. Um, and Kudos to Kenwood, because my daughter goes there, <laughs> and she's in the IB program there, and she loves it. She talks you guys up all the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn. Thanks. Just trying to get off mute. Um, I, I really appreciate this, uh, all the work that you guys do in, in, in this um, presentation. Um, I'm on slide 16, the CTE programs of study, and I just wanted to clarify something. You talk about clusters um, covered in each geographic region and at least three CTE programs at each school. And I'm noticing in the smack dab in the middle, Towson High School has two boxes by it. And I'm trying to understand <clears throat> if there's like a mistake on your slide there's something else I don't know about. Um, uh, you know, I, I know a lot about Towson since I've had two children go through there. Um, and I know it's there's a magnet there, uh, but it, it looks as if perhaps we need another program there if we're claiming three across every school in the, in, in the area. Yeah, I can comment on that. So ProStart is actually going to be the third program. They just started up this year. So our map does need updated. Um, I believe they'll have CCRD, business education, and then ProStart. Um, I believe they're offering the first, maybe the first and second course there. Um, so we just have to add that to the figure in the updated map. But good course. Great. Yep. No, it's a, it's a, there's a lot going on in that map. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of boxes and colors. Yep and what have you, so I'm trying to follow it. But uh, just real quick, what is ProStart? Um, so ProStart is, um, it, it's really a recently developed program we added in BCPS that build off of our old, somewhat locally developed family consumer science program. Um, students leave with a certification, whereas previously they did not. So it's not to the ACF level that we have at our other culinary arts programs, where students, you know, they're, they're getting that high-end culinary arts, but they're getting introductions and they're getting serve, serve safe certifications, such as Mr. Powell mm -hmm. talked about. So it's a little bit more introductory compared to our culinary arts programs. Fantastic. Yep. Uh, two other things, uh, or at least one other thing I'd like to mention. We have Towson University right here. Um, and I, I believe that there is a dual uh, enrollment program available there. Um, but I figured I'd bring it up to you all since you own this to confirm that for students because there's a significant amount of classes 
that that university offers, and it's a great facility in the heart of the county. So perhaps, I don't know if you can speak to that, but you know, I believe that is the case. Um, but keep up the good work. This is fantastic, and I, you know, I really, I really fully support <laughs> CTE programs across the entire county. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And um, just to address your question, um, all Maryland University System schools do provide our high school students with a 25% tuition reduction if they take courses uh, at their institutions. And we do have students who take courses at Towson University. So thank you for your query. Thank you. Next looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Good evening. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, as was mentioned by my colleagues, it's really um, encouraging. I've had the um, pleasure to watch this program grow with Doug Handy's work and now uh, with Dr. Grubb's work and everyone else that's on the team going to the JA Aspire event when it was in person before COVID, uh, seeing Project Lead the Way, other AVID programs. Um, also um, going to visit an aviation program where I did not fly the, uh, <laughs> the drone that well, but I didn't break it because they bought sturdy ones, so that was encouraging. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to ask about uh, was around the dual enrollment. So how does that work with the students being uh, enrolled in the school, a school, and then also taking college courses at CCBC in terms of logistically? That's an excellent question. Um, we have two options for our students. They can, um, working with their school counselors and their, and their school administrators, they may qualify for early release. So they may spend part of the time in their locally zoned school and then um, be released to go take courses either online or on lo location at CCBC or even on location at our own high schools. Um, if they have a full schedule and they wish to take courses. We have a fifth slot in our scheduling um, uh, blocks where the counselor can use the generic dual enrollment course number. So colleges and universities see that the students are participating in dual enrollment while also having a full uh, schedule in the high school. That is very impressive. Um, and the other thing I wanted to um, have you have you think about it and, and Dr. Williams can um, provide comments back to the board is what can we do at the board level to uh, further the success of this program? You talk about disrupting biases uh, against uh, student groups, whether it's gender, race, uh, special uh, populations that we have. And, um, you know, I know that there was funding that was cut at the high school level years ago, um, and it has started to be restored. Is that something that's going to be more important in the future? Um, in terms of funding for Naviance, that's an amazing program. I've used that with all three of my students. Um, so what is it that we can do to be uh, further supportive ambassadors, cheerleaders, uh, to, to just uh, continue this amazing work? So Ms. Causey, this is uh, Dr. McComas. Thank you as always um, for your comments and support. I would uh, suggest that as we move forward, as we bring forward uh, innovative programs, for example, the artificial intelligence or the aviation programs, um, you know, we present at curriculum committee uh, to build awareness and understanding. And then that usually ends up in coming to the board for a contract and resources. And so we just ask that you continue to partner with us uh, in both the approval and budgetary resources to make sure that our programs remain current and relevant for our students as the economy and job market continues to evolve. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from board members? Make sure I got everyone. Okay, that looks like that is it then. Thank you all so very much. Um, I, I oh, excuse would, me. I would like to thank Principal Jernigan and Principal Powell I know it's been a long day. Thank you for staying with us. And thank you, Dr. Woodridge and Dr. Grubbs. Again, we appreciate the collaboration. We appreciate the example. Particularly, we have example of West Zone 
and East Zone and the great work that's happening in all three zones, but definitely to highlight just an example of what's happening in our high school. So thank you for your participation and presentation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I like given the lateness. Um, I'd like to make a motion to postpone postpone items P through R to the December seventh board meeting. So moved, Row. Second, Offerman. I think it's been moved and seconded. Okay. All right. And um, just to speak to it, it's late. I would really like everyone to make it home safely. So um, let's speak into my motion. Um, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote, please? Madam Chair, what items are those, please? Hold on for a second. Oh, excuse me, one moment. What's those items, Tracy? Um, I'll see them. Oh, board um, I can give the information. So it's, um, if you have uh, board docs, it's item P. So it's update on the cyber attack. Q, financial report. Um, for the month ending September 21st, Southeast Area Education Advisory Council, and then the last one of uh, the board committee updates, agenda setting that we do, and um, and then we just go to the end of the meeting and just announcements. Um, may I ask that we, um, the budget committee has two motions that um, we'd like to bring forward. May I ask that we separate um, committee updates or if you would consider an amendment to only include the recommendations from the budget committee rather than full committee updates in your motion so if i understand it correctly you you would like to make um i guess to make a motion about the budget committee update just address that singularly yes ma'am one is time sensitive um the budget okay. committee is bringing forward two recommendations um, one of which is time sensitive. Okay, so um, you'd like to do, um, have the opportunity to bring those up. All right, um, Mr. Bersades, what is the best way for us to do this, to make an amendment to, because the motion was moved and seconded to move items P through R to the December 7th board meeting. Um, Ms. Hen, it looks like she would like to do her board committee update for the budget committee and um, uh, she has a motion she'd like to, or, or I guess she said it's two motions she wants to bring. Uh, you can uh, move to postpone uh, P through S, is it? Um, uh, with the exception of the budget committee report. Okay. So then I could withdraw my motion then? Sure. And then, um, okay, so I withdraw my motion. And so I make a motion to postpone items P through S with the exception of the budget committee report. Second, Thomas. Seconded by Tom. Okay. okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, thank you. you, Mr. Bersades. Yes, thank you, Mr. Bersades. It's very helpful. Okay, so if we could, um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote for that, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Haker? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the Ms. So then we can go forward to the, um, yes, uh, uh, sorry, we're in the chat. Um, he's retyping it in, Ms. Causey. And so now we will go to committee updates and Ms. Hen will give the update from the budget committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the budget committee is bringing forward two recommendations. Um, the first of which, um, and these were emailed to the full board, um, including you, Madam Chair. Um, the budget committee asks for board approval of the following motion. The board asks the superintendent to, I mean, phrase this as a motion. Um, I move that the board ask the superintendent to implement a survey to collect feedback from school principals on staffing and other school resource needs for the current budget cycle 
and for summary and raw data to be shared with superintendents, designees, and the board. So moved. And Matt. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Um, no second is needed as this recommendation comes from the committee. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so that's the first one. It was seconded by Ms. Mack. Okay, so. Um, oh, I apologize. It was moved by Ms. Mack. And no second is needed. Excuse me. Me. It was moved by Ms. Hen. All right, and no second is needed as Ms. Hen stated because it comes as a recommendation from the committee. So, um, Ms. Skilver, do a roll call vote, please. And I believe Dr. Hager has a comment, Madam Chair. Uh, let's see. Uh, she must be in the chat. I'm getting that up now. Okay, yes, Dr. Hager, please go ahead. Um, just clarifying, this is only um, principals in all of our schools, and you want the raw data knowing which principal said what and all of and, and all that detail? Is that what you're, you're hoping for? Yes. Um, the committee would like the summary as well as the raw data to be shared with the superintendent's designees, whomever he decides he would like to share that with, as well as the board. So for the board to receive both summary and raw data, as well as the superintendent's designees. Um, I, I, I'm so tired and I was really, really late, but um, often, you know, we try to de-identify data and things like that, just so that principals know that what they're saying isn't necessarily going to be, um, you know, come back to them. Um, just putting it out there, and I don't know that it needs an amendment, but just when you say raw data, it sounds like it's identifiable. So that, that's my only comment. Um, again, I think it's it's probably not worth amending or anything, but just thank you. And, and okay, it looks like there's a yes. I, I, okay, it looks like there's a comment from Ms. Pastor. I'm trying to make yeah, sure that I we just, get to everybody. Yeah, I'm gonna say this quick. I just want to point out, um, particularly to Dr. Hager, that in years, years past, principals were always able to speak to their area superintendents or assistant superintendents, whatever they were called, and talk about some things that were specific to their schools. Also, there were conversations with people from HR. Our area advisory councils also go out and ask um, uh, principals for those same kinds of things. They, they do it sometimes at the budget meetings, sometimes they call them. Um, Some way along the journey before Dr. Williams um, something happened, and we don't have that level of communication. But that communication will help the superintendent and staff see some things that they might not ordinarily see, and they can also see patterns. So they can see if some of the things that a principal at one school needs is something that principals in several schools are doing. So it does help undergird um, what they're at, for what they're asking and principals I'm sure in case they're doing the same thing. Thank you. Yes, and I put the motion in the chat. I for some reason it's highlighted in pink. Um, but I, I put it in there. Um, so are we ready for for to take a vote? Okay. Excuse me. Yes, Dr. I, Williams. I do feel a need to respond to this. Um, the principals have representation. That's called case or they are part of the professional organization, I'm gonna get it right, AESA or SSAA. I wanna go back to what Dr. Hager said. I appreciate that the board budget committee wants to get feedback from the principal. I wanna go back to, I think what Ms. Hen said about the superintendent designee and to bring back themes from this, from this survey so there's no identifiable names or anything. Let us work through the already established organizations and groups that exist. Cases one, AESA and SSAA. And I don't know if that's, I don't know if I'm changing the motion or not, but I, I just think the raw data, there's another, you, you, you may not, well, there's a different way to be efficient to get themes 
from the 176 principals and administrators, I think that's a 400 and some odd assistant principals. So I'm just thinking about the process. Mm. Okay, thank you for that, Dr. Williams. And also, I, I just would um, say that this, again, this is a motion that was sent over to the full board at 8 o'clock, almost 8.30 at, at night. Um, we have not had time to properly, uh, I feel, vet it and look at it. it. I feel like it's very last minute, and we are debating it almost at midnight on a, a Tuesday night. So um, I, just, I just don't feel that it's getting the proper vetting and proper conversation that needs to be had in order to make a concerted um, opinion on um, something um, that, is I think um, we'll have a large amount of reverberations. Um, looks like there's a comment from Ms. Causey. Please go ahead. Thank you. I also see in the chat that Ms. Hen would like to speak to her motion. So I, I, I feel she should do that first and then I'll make my comment if that's okay, Madam Chair. I thought she already spoke to the motion, but yes, please quickly. Thank you, Mrs. Causey and thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I did want to speak to this because we discussed it at length yeah. in committee and it did pass unanimously, um, both the intent and um, spirit of the motion, as well as the desire for raw data. Um, members spoke to the desire to receive wish lists, I believe it was the terminology used, directly from principals. Um, and as Ms. Pester said, this is information that board members do not receive. Um, it was we asked staff directly, is this data that is tracked currently? Do you have direct input from principals that you can provide us with? What are their lists above and beyond the allocations that they currently receive? What are their needs for staffing above and beyond their given allocations? What are their program needs above and beyond? So that the board can make data-driven decisions. That is what the goal of this motion is. It's so that we can go into our budget work sessions with actual data from actual schools, from the individuals that know their needs best, our school principals. I have the you know conversations as do most of us with principals all the time. And in a five minute conversation, I get those nuggets of data, but I want that systematically or system wide so that I'm not hearing, you know, basing my decisions on two, three, five principals just in my district. We are representing the entire system. I want the big picture. I want 175, 176 profiles, those wish lists. What does our system need? What are the needs above and beyond um, those allocations? That was the conversation that was had in committee and was agreed upon unanimous, unanimously that we need this data, that we can't wait for this data, that it would be simple enough to collect from our principals. And as was mentioned by another committee member, we want it raw. We want to know what those schools Okay, are that's collecting. time. Thank you, Ms. Hen. Ms. Causey, you had a comment too, please. Thank you. I just would like to say um, that I am supporting this um, request of the superintendent. And I would just point out that the board is requesting information. It's a very simple statement. And if the raw data, uh, if, if the design of the survey would be that the raw data is does not include a principal name, if that's important, but then we would still see the data of the 176 schools, the requests and so forth, um, or even, you know, the 100 elementary schools. Here's the, you know, the 27 middle schools and the 24 high schools. So I think it's, um, op I think it's governance, governance correct in that we're making an overarching request to support our responsibilities of um, processing a budget. Uh, and then the superintendent and his team can uh, do the administrative and operational pieces of how the survey works. So I'll support this motion and I appreciate it coming forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I put the motion in the chat. Um, yes, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Uh I think I'll also be supporting this motion because just as I constantly say I want to hear directly from the students, want to hear directly from the people in the school. I want to hear directly from our school leaderships to kind of or leadership teams to see what we truly need. And so I appreciate the committee uh, bringing this forward and, and wanting to get that perspective from our principals who, I mean, speaking to many, uh, well, who I think would really like to be heard and, and would want to have an opportunity like this to directly communicate with the board and not just communicate uh, through their representatives so thank you okay thank you can we take a vote are we ready to 
to vote on this, please? Okay. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, and is there another one, Ms. Hen, or is that it? There is. Thank you, board members. Um, the second recommendation from the committee, um, the committee asked for board approval of the following motion. I move that the board ask the superintendent to implement an online survey to collect public input on the fiscal year 2024 budget modeled on the Fairfax and Montgomery County instruments. And Madam Chair, may I speak to the motion? Okay, so let me state it. Um, Ms. Hen moved that the board asks that the superintendent, excuse me, the board asks the superintendent to implement an online survey to collect public input on the fiscal year 2024 budget modeled on the Fairfax and Montgomery County instruments. And no second is needed as it comes from the committee. Yes, please speak to your motion. Thank you. So this is not for the current um, budget year, but for um, next budget year because the committee recognizes that this will take some time to implement. Um, staff provided us, thank you, um, Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Saris, examples of similar online surveys after hearing what the committee hoped to accomplish. Um, the Fairfax District, as well as Montgomery County, have both implemented online surveys um, where their stakeholders can submit input on their um, operating budget, um, as it's being developed and the committee discussed the need to um, or desire to do something similar. So given um, we are a year out, we would like to ask the superintendent to implement something similar. All right, once again, I've put the motion in the chat so everyone could see it. Um, so are there any questions? Okay, hearing none. Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Uh, trying to say yes. Ms. Mack? Trying to yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Sorry. Ms. Pester? Abstain. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, and last but not least, the last item is the agenda. <laughs> the agenda's announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, December 7th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. Thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned. Good night. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody.